Good. Order, please. Just before we begin with the daily routine, the topic for late debate this evening at the moment of interruption as submitted by the Honourable Member for Halifax Shabucko and the leader of the New Democratic Party is therefore be it resolved that the Liberal government has profoundly disrespected the people of Pictou Landing First Nation, mill workers, forestry workers, fishers, tourism operators, and others by its negligent handling of the situation at Northern Pulp and its failure to affirm that the January 31st, 2020 deadline for Boat Harbour will be honoured. That is late debate this evening at the moment of interruption. We'll now begin with the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions. Presenting reports of committees, the Honourable Chair of the Law Amendments Committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as chair of the Committee on Law Amendments, I'm directed to report that the committee has met and considered the following bills. Bill number 169, an act to amend Chapter 156 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Expropriation Act. Bill number 175, an act to amend Chapter 32 of the Acts of 2015, the Marine Renewable Energy Act. Bill number 177, an act to amend Chapter 380 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Public Utilities Act. Bill number 180, an act to amend Chapter 31 of the Acts of 2001, the Fatality Investigations Act. And Bill number 187, an act to amend Chapter 1, 1992 Supplement of the Revised Statutes 1989, the House of Assemblies Act. The committee recommends these bills to the favourable consideration of the House without amendment. Ordered that these bills be referred to the Committee of the Whole House on Bills. Tabling reports, regulations and other papers. Statements by Ministers. Government notices of motion. The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas today, Wednesday, October 16th, is We Day Atlantic, which celebrates young people making a difference in their local and global communities. And whereas teachers and students from across Nova Scotia are taking part in the event because of their hard work and passion about enacting positive change. And whereas young people in our province embody the me to we philosophy and inspire their peers and all of us, therefore be resolved that all members of this legislature recognize We Day Atlantic and also recognize the impact these students have made on their communities and thank Craig and Mark Kilberger for their WE team and their WE team for the impact they've had on the lives of countless young people across the globe. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Joining us in the gallery today in recognition of World Food Day, which is today, are key members of the Mobile Food Market, an innovative program that brings more affordable fresh food directly to communities across HRM. And I would ask them to stand as I call out their names. Julia Kemp is with us today. She's a manager at the Mobile Food Market, which works with community groups, organizations, and leaders to address food issues in communities. Her goal with the market is to help people in communities who may experience challenges with accessing healthy food, and this includes older Nova Scotians, those with mobility issues, people living on lower incomes, and those with limited access to transportation. And joining Ms. Kemp today is Dave Rideout. Dave is president and CEO of MetroWorks, which is the home for the mobile food market program. And MetroWorks dedicates its time to helping thousands of people overcome obstacles and realize their employment and educational goals through community-led programming and supports. They're committed to helping people overcome barriers and gain the confidence and skills needed to get ahead in life. And I would ask my colleagues to give them the warm welcome of the house. Yeah. 
The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas on October 16th, communities around the world will mark World Food Day to increase awareness of world hunger and poverty and to inspire solutions for world change. And whereas here in Nova Scotia, we're continuing to reduce poverty and, reduce and increase food security through initiatives such as the Poverty Reduction Blueprint and the Building Vibrant Communities Grant. Grants. And whereas these grants have already had a positive impact on communities throughout the province with projects like the Mobile Food Market, which brings healthy food to Nova Scotians living on lower incomes, as well as other pro projects that increase access to transportation or youth transitions, for example. Therefore, be it resolved, all members of this legislature recognize that everyone has a role to play in reducing poverty in Nova Scotia and commit to working within their respective communities to alleviate food insecurity. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas on October 16th, communities around the world will celebrate World Food Day to increase awareness of world hunger and poverty and to inspire solutions for world change. And whereas here in Nova Scotia, we are very blessed to have Hope Blooms, the nationally renowned social enterprise that empowers and teaches leadership skills to at-risk youth in North End of Halifax. Whereas Invest Nova Scotia's independent board has recently provided Hope Blooms with a $1.2 million loan to build a new kitchen by its organic garden and greenhouse. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the legislature recognize the community building and entrepreneurship that are baked into Hope Blooms and join me in congratulating them on this next step in their journey to empower their community through leadership, shared responsibility, and locally produced food. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Norwich, Nova Scotia supports the School Healthy Eating Program, which is available in 94% of our schools, and provides students with breakfast and snack programs to support their health and nutritional well-being. And whereas the government's partnership with Nourish Nova Scotia helps ensure students are well nourished, have more energy, are less distracted by hunger, and are ready to learn. And whereas October 16th is World Food Day, an opportunity to recognize Nourish Nova Scotia as it continues to cultivate nutrition, knowledge, food skills, and healthy eating practices in Nova Scotia students. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the House of Assembly show their support for World Food Day and acknowledge the importance of well-nourished Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Aquaculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the economies of our rural community depend on the success of agriculture industry and more young people are encouraged to see this industry as a viable career choice. Whereas the Agriculture on Farm student bursary program allows Nova Scotia's post-secondary students to receive financial support to work on one of our many farms and to learn many career opportunities are available to the, the agriculture industry. Whereas $125,000 is available through the Canadian Agriculture Partnership and students earn a bursary of $500 for 250 hours or $1,000 for 500 hours. Therefore, we resolve that all members of this House of Assembly recognize the connection young people to farms, give them a hands-on experience and help the agriculture industry reach its potential. Mr. Speaker, I'd ask for waiver of notice and passage to the debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. 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 Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Aquaculture and Fisheries. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Lieutenant Governor's Award of Excellence in Nova Scotia Wines was established by the former Lieutenant Governor J.J. Grant in 2014 to recognize the exceptional quality of local sourced and, and produced wines. Whereas members of the Winery Association of Nova Scotia and Taste of Nova Scotia are invited to submit up to three commercially available wines with 100% Nova Scotia grape content. And whereas experts choose have chosen the following wines as best. 2011 Blanche Noir Extra Brut Reserve from Avondale Sky Winery, 2011 Brut Reserve from Blomington Estates Winery, and 2018 Tidal Bay from Joe's Vineyards, and 2018 Tidal Bay from Planters Ridge Winery. Therefore, it be resolved that all members of this House of Assembly recognize and honour and to bestow upon these fine products and the dedication and craft of those in Nova Scotia's wine industry as they help us grow our rural economy. Mr. Speaker, I would ask for a waiver of notice and pass it to the debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. We'll now move on to introduction of bills. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 18 of the Acts of 1998, the Municipal Government Act, and Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting on-site sewage disposal equipment. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 18 of the Acts of 1998, the Municipal Government Act, and Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting on-site sewage disposal equipment. Bill number 201, entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 18 of the Acts of 1998, the Municipal Government Act. In chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter respecting on-site sewage disposal equipment. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 401 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Residential Tenancies <laughs> Act. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 401 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Residential Tenancies Act. Bill number 202, entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 401 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Residential Tenancies Act. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting the Labour Relationship Between Her Majesty and Right of the Province of no and the Nova Scotia Crown Attorneys Association. The Honourable Minister of Finance begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting the Labour Relationship Between Her Majesty and the Right of the Province and the Nova Scotia Crown Attorneys Association. Bill number 203, entitled An Act Respecting the Labour Relationship Between Her Majesty and Right of the Province and the Nova Scotia Crown Attorneys Association. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. <laughs> we'll now move on to notices of motion. Statements by members. Statement. The Honourable Member for Bedford. Mr. Speaker, I beg uh, leave to make an introduction, please. Permission granted. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to direct the members' attention to the East Gallery, uh, and I would ask them to stand as their names are mentioned. We're joined today by Lou and John Turner. 
Lou uh, is a longtime Bedford resident. He's actually one of my favourite residents of Bedford. Uh, Lou, Lou joined the fire department when he was uh, 17 years old. I've, I've seen some fantastic pictures of him over the years, and uh, I'm delighted that he and his son could join us here today. Lou is 91. I know he doesn't look it, uh, but he's here to join us at the house. I would ask the house give him a warm welcome. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Bedford. Mr. Speaker, this year Bedford is celebrating a milestone anniversary for its volunteer firefighters. Eighty years ago, this assembly passed, and I quote, an act to enable the residents of Bedford in the county of Halifax to provide themselves with fire protection, unquote, legislation that was followed by a few amendments over the years. What hasn't changed in the ensuing years is the dedication of our volunteer firefighters. They've protected us from fires at structures large and small. They've trained vigorously. They welcomed their first woman firefighter years before many other departments. And if all of this weren't enough, they raised money for the IWK, the Muscular Dystrophy Association, and Christmas Daddies. Recently, our local historical museum, Scott Manor House, displayed some firefighting memorabilia to mark the anniversary. I love seeing many of, our, many of our former members come out to share their stories, and I love seeing photos of them when they were still wet behind their ears. And I realize these people are a family, a family that over the years has protected our families. I hold them in the highest of esteem, and I thank them for their service. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Oh, the Honourable Member for Pictou East. Mr. Speaker, uh, I rise today just to give a uh, word of appreciation for the province's uh, count at, Crown attorneys and the justice system. Our Crowns are dedicated professionals that have really invested their entire life in bringing justice to victims, often victims of heinous crimes. Uh, they are the, the line of protection between society as we see it. Keep going. And and the and and um, protecting our, our justice system. So, ask all members of the house to join me in, in supporting a, a functioning justice system, and supporting those that, that that bring justice to victims. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The honourable member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would draw the members' attention to the gallery opposite, where we're joined by Jane Barber, her son Ewan, and her grandchildren Lena and Logan. Uh, they're residents of Dartmouth South, and I ask the members of the House to give them a warm welcome. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Jane Barber. Jane is a Dartmouth resident who takes on the role of community builder wherever she goes. In the past year, Jane founded a birthday club at Alderney Manor in Dartmouth, a monthly celebration with coffee, tea, cake and sandwiches, which drew building residents together to celebrate one another. In a building with many seniors, and socially isolated individuals. She also organized a health and wellness fair with nearly 30 vendors from community health resources to HRM Transit to the public library. Neighbors were able to connect with the resources they might not otherwise have had direct access to, and the event was an unqualified success. I was happy to be a part of it. Creating opportunity for a community to grow is challenging work, but wherever she goes, activities and events follow. Please join me in thanking Jane for her dedication to the Dartmouth community. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West on an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Mr. Speaker, I draw the member's attention to the East Gallery, where we're joined today by retired Chief Martin Bell of the Conqueror Bank community in Lunenburg County, and he's joined today by his spouse Cheryl and his mother Edith. And I would ask uh, the members of the House to bring them a warm welcome. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Martin Bell from Conqueror Bank. The retired chief is the 2019 Canadian Volunteer Fire Services Lifetime Achievement Award recipient. This national prestigious award honors an individual whose remarkable achievements in the fire service and community exemplifies outstanding performance. Chief Bell joined the Conqueror Bank Fire Department in 1973 rising through the ranks and serving as a chief for 15 years. He was a volunteer instructor with the Nova Scotia Fire School and his department 
was one of the first in the province to provide medical first responder services outside Metro. He also motivated and led an inspired team of firefighters, ladies auxiliaries and his community to build a brand new department in 1987. Chief Bell was also recently awarded an honorary lifetime membership for his fire department where he takes on a leadership role in the department but also served on national senior positions and national boards. Thank you to Chief Bell for his dedication and commitment to his community and congratulations on this remarkable achievement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Mr. Speaker, today I want to rise and wish a happy birthday to a local resident, Amy Hoadley, who's celebrating her 40th birthday today. Amy is the third generation of her family to call Sackville home and has resided there since she was born. She continues to reside there now with her beloved family and pets. Amy is a graduate of Millwood High School and she's currently returned to school to pursue a medical administration and set to graduate in November. Most importantly, Amy's the mother of one of our office students, Kaylee, so that's her, probably her number one role, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to take an opportunity to wish Amy a very happy birthday and wish her the best of luck in finishing the school this year and her future endeavors. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Mr. Speaker, in our East Gallery today, uh, we are joined by members of the Halifax Wanderers. I'd like them to rise as I call their names. We have uh, Stephen Hart, coach of the Wanderers, uh, most decorated coach that has ever come out of this province uh, by a country mile. A uh, fantastic individual and definitely a player's coach, which I know all of his players can attest to. We are joined by Vice President of Operations, Matt Fegan, and we are joined by players, Jean-Michael Williams, Elton John, Andre Rampersad, Vincent Lamy, Krizno Ensa, and we are also joined uh, by Denai Yatru, who's the Community Coordinator, and Dylan Lawrence, who works in creative in the office. I'd like to give them the warm applause of the house. Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Mr. Speaker, the Halifax Wanderers are in their first year with the Canadian Premier League. With dynamic flair, coaches and players embrace not only the competitiveness of the game, but the support that comes with being our hometown team. In turn, they have been thoroughly embraced by Halifax and our surrounding communities. Coach Stephen Hart has brought a variety, a very competitive team to the pitch and the best atmosphere out of any stadium. Wanderers fans, young and old, are recognized for their unwavering dedication, evident from the screaming fans, especially the loudest ones in the kitchen. The Wanderers have reached out into the soccer community and beyond, and there are many events interacting with fans. They make us very proud. I look forward to next season, Mr. Speaker. Season tickets are on sale currently, and I look forward to another fantastic year. I ask that all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature join me in congratulating the Halifax Wanderers for their commitment to the sport and to the community of Halifax. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to stand here today to bring awareness to World Restart a Heart Day, celebrated on October 16th since last year. The global initiative is to increase awareness of the importance of high-quality bystander CPR and to increase bystander CPR rates around the world. Each year, there are more than 40,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests in Canada. 80 to 85 percent occur in a public setting, and fewer than 10 percent survive to discharge from hospital. Bystanders play an important role in cardiac arrest survival. Immediate chest compressions can double or triple the survival. That's why it's so important to get trained in CPR. I urge all members of this House to get trained and to promote in their communities the importance of high-quality CPR. Push fast and hard, and everyone can save a life. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hans East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I make an introduction? Permission granted. I want to draw uh, the member's house to the East Gallery, where we are joined by Bo Wombolt. I'll ask her to stand. She's a very respected uh, community member in East Hans. Uh, she's a bus driver, so she looks after the safety of our young people. Uh, she's a very busy real estate agent and the founder of an online uh, community page. So I ask all members uh, to award her the, the warm welcome of the House on this, her first visit to the Legislature. The Honourable Member for Hans East. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is an incredible online group in my constituency that keeps community members connected. East Hands wants to know is a Facebook group with 11,500 members. This is half the population of East Hands. This is a group where members can ask questions about businesses and services, community events and supports, and even help find help in retrieving a lost wedding ring. Bo Wombold is the creator and the admin of the East Hands Wants to Know. She wanted to create a safe place where people could be informed of what's going on in our community. As a matter of fact, I once uh, posted on East Hands Wants to Know, wanting to know what uh, the people of East Hands had on their wish list, and I got over 200 responses. Not unlike our job, Mr. Speaker, this is a thankless job for Bo. Her, zero, uh, her strict zero tolerance policy on bullying and unhelpful comments may have upset a few, few residents, but it has created a place of inclusion for the majority of our community. Mr. Speaker, I ask that all members of this House join me in recognizing Bull's unwavering dedication to the site which brings so many from our community together. Thank you, Bull. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Gail Hamlin of Liverpool who for many years has worked to keep a lost art alive. A retired home economics teacher, Gail's love and natural talent for sewing date back to her childhood. For many years since then, Gail has worked to produce hand-stitched and historically accurate colonial and Revolutionary War era costumes for reenactment groups throughout the province and for our local tourism interpreters in Queen's County and other community projects. One such group is the King's Orange Rangers. Since their creation in 1994, Gail has outfitted the entire regiment with their distinctive red wool coats and all of the accessories. Mr. Speaker, I would like to express appreci appreciation to Gail for the countless hours she has dedicated to her craft. Her attention to every detail is truly admirable, and she is a wonderful ambassador for her community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, tonight at 6.30, members of the Dartmouth North community will gather for the 21st anniversary of a very important annual event, the Walk Against Violence. The Walk Against Violence was created by Alan McCullough and Carolyn McCullough in response to the murder of their son, Dartmouth North teenager and Boys and Girls Club kid and volunteer Jason McCullough in 1999. The walk began as a way to support the families of victims of violent crime and as a way to bring the community together in peaceful solidarity. Tonight's walk will begin at the Boys and Girls Club in uh, Dartmouth North site on Farrell Street and organizers will be accepting donations for the Jason McCullough Memorial Scholarship. This event is a beautiful show of community spirit and resilience, and I look forward to attending tonight with my children. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the Blockhouse and Area Ratepayers Kinship, also known as BARC, who officially opened their new park located at the four-way stop in Blockhouse this past summer. The park is a beautifully landscaped area that includes park benches for community members and visitors to enjoy. In order to choose a name for the park, the Kinship hosted a contest in which five-year-old Easton Walters, who attends Bayview Community School, won, deeming the park the Blockhouse Community Park. Bark directors Blaine Knickle, Mary Jane Heisen, Paul Young and Wanda Martell spearhead this group of avid volunteers focused on enhancing the, a sense of community for Blockhouse and the surrounding areas. Mr. Speaker, I ask that you and the members of this House of Assembly join me in recognizing the volunteers of Bark and congratulate them on the opening of the Blockhouse Community Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to congratulate Avery Smith, an extremely talented 14-year-old baseball player from Spring Hill. Avery has played for Team Nova Scotia, the Spring Hill Fence Busters, the Pee Wee AAA Truro Bearcats, the Amherst Little League Club Cubs, and was the only female player on the Amherst Athletics 15 and under team, which won provincial championship this year. Last year, Avery played at the Atlantic Championships in St. John's, Newfoundland, where she was scouted to play for the Chicago Pioneers 15 and under team, which came in second in the USA Nationals in August. Please join me in congratulating Avery Smith, who is not only an outstanding athlete with the great achievements, but also a great mentor to other female players in her sport, and we wish her continued success in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kings South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Nova Scotia has a remarkable history of great storytellers, and I'm delighted to share with this House a developing new talent. Dana Mills of Lumsden Dam is a recipient of the annual Writers Trust of Canada Rising Star Program. This career development program recognizes talented authors in their early stages of their careers and includes a $5,000 grant, mentorship, and a two-week writing residency at the Banff Centre for Arts and Creativity. Mills' first collection of short stories, Somewhere, Someone Somewhere, was published by Gaspro Press and has been shortlisted for the Journey Prize given by the Writers' Trust of Canada for the best short story in a Canadian literary magazine. Mills' work has been published in several magazines, including the New Quarterly and Geist, and recently was in, he was invited to Toronto to meet with editors and read his work aloud at the, at the Art Gallery of Ontario. I invite all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Dana Mills on winning the Raiders Trust of Canada Rising Star Program Award and wish him success in his promising writing career. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, I, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Thank you. I'd like to welcome in the West Gallery, please stand, Angela and Steve Wilkins with one-year-old baby Ezra. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I would like to talk about the importance of mothers and the fact that they are never fully appreciated, for mothers bring the gift of life. It is important that supports are in place for new mothers in the form of education and in the form of access to health care. Today, I want to give thanks to a young new mother, Angela Wilkins, and through her own life experience, has learned of the inadequacies of the supports for new mothers. I would like to thank Angela today for being outward focused and for seeking ways of helping others. The true heart of a mother and a registered nurse, I might add. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Speaker, today I want to uh, salute the courage, creativity, and heart that Jessica Hepburn has brought to her campaign to be MP of South Shore St. Margaret's for the NDP. You may have heard the advice, start the way you intend to continue. Well, Jessica has started her political career the way that she intends to continue it, bravely and with community as her focus. She has connected with residents by, yes, attending debates and going door to door, but also by inviting them to come together. After a scandal led uh, all Canadians to talk about blackface, she hosted a, a dinner to talk about race and politics in her cafe, uh, The Biscuit Eater in Mahombe. As the only woman of colour running in Nova Scotia in this election, and as someone who has spent her entire life Thinking about issues of social justice, racial justice, and environmental justice, she is uniquely qualified for to, to convene that important conversation. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. On May 23, 2019, Charlene Bootlier Thomas from North River Colchester North received an Excellence in Nursing Administration Award from the College of Registered Nurses for her work in mental health. Thomas, who grew up in Dominion, Cape Breton, said she was interested in the mental health area of nursing from the moment she decided on her career. She soon realized that healing was not only physical but also emotional. Throughout her career, she has worked in the mental health area in hospitals, in provincial leadership, and with the Department of Community Services. She helped develop a model of care for people with intellectual difficulties, with setting up palliative care services, and with Helpline. She is the past president of the Colchester East Hants branch of the Canadian Mental Health Association. For many years, she has operated complete counselling services, her own private practice in Truro. Her greatest reward is being part of someone's life as their life becomes better. Congratulations, Charlene, on a well-deserved award and for your numerous contributions to improve mental health. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Mr. Speaker, Daryl McKinnon, a resident of Pictou County and a former power line technician, <laughs> slipped on ice at his workplace on February 13, 2012 and injured himself. Approximately a year post-accident, Mr. McKinnon began to report bilateral hand tremors poor balance, increasing vision, deterioration, and decreased muscle strength. WCB continued to deny Darrell his benefits, even though several neurologists claim their findings showed his symptoms affected his ability 
to safely carry out his work duties. No wonder our best neurologists are frustrated with decisions from WCB caseworkers that continue to deny workers that have been injured on the job site. The caseworkers' hardly surprising denial is typical. Meanwhile, the many injured workers find themselves in a marathon of doctor referrals, paperwork and denials. Imagine WCB personnel are not accountable for their decisions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize Emma Lomas, a skilled grade 12 player of the Halifax West girls soccer team. Emma has been playing soccer for almost nine years, mostly in the position of defense. She has been a member of both Dumbrack and City Soccer Clubs. Emma was also uh, recognized for her skills as a member of the Farias Soccer Acad Academy Showcase Program and women's team. Emma has been playing for Halifax West for three years now. As a senior, Emma is, Emma is a role model for the younger girls on the team, both on and off, off the field. Aside from playing soccer, Emma works hard to maintain her high academic average in school. Emma is also involved in many extracurricular activities. She serves as an ambassador for the Nova Scotia International Student Program, an organization committed to providing educational opportunities to students from abroad in Nova Scotia. Emma also has spent her past two summers as a youth counselor at Bayside Camp in Sambro. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank Emma for all she does for our community and congratulate her and her teammates for their successes. I wish them the best, best of luck in upcoming season. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to recognize LT Taylor, a dedicated volunteer in the Dartmouth community. LT is a retired Royal Canadian Navy engineer who has been a mentor for the high school robotics teams since 2002. He started at Auburn High School when his son got involved in Robots East in grade 11. Since 2010, he has helped the underwater robotics team at Prince Andrew High School. PA students have benefited greatly over the years from his knowledge, skills and wisdom, getting a glimpse of the unique real-life hands-on engineering found on naval vessels. The students and staff he has worked with have expressed to me how grateful they are for his efforts. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank Mr. Taylor for his dedication to students, and I ask all members of this House to acknowledge the outstanding work of Mr. Taylor in promoting science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, Northwood, the largest not-for-profit continuing care organization in Atlantic Canada, is celebrating the grand opening of its new adult day centre in Dartmouth North today. The new space at 130 Eileen Stubbs Avenue in Burnside will be home to Northwood's Dartmouth Adult Day Program for people with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, stroke, Parkinson's disease, or those who are physically frail. The new location offers full and half-day programs for people who need a little extra care. When I met with the Northwood team in advance of this new, program, this new program opening, it was impossible not to feel excited about the new space and the programs that will now be available to folks in Dartmouth. Though I was not able to make the grand opening and ribbon cutting today, I am so pleased that Northwood is expanding their services in Dartmouth North. I know that this important new programming will improve the lives of many seniors and their families in our community. The Honourable Member for Claire Digby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 1995, Cedric Robichaux started his company, BMCC Foods Limited, buying lobster from one fishing boat. From this start, BMC has expanded its facilities several times. Expansions precipitated as the company increased their lobster sales in our traditional markets and in new markets in Asia and Europe. Earlier this year, BMC announced its biggest expansion to date, an expansion that will be completed in two phases. The company will first purchase new equipment for its facilities and increase its holding capacity by 50,000 pounds. Then BMC will build a tank shop to hold an additional 750,000 pounds of lobster. When complete, BMC will operate year-round and raise its processing capability to 10 million pounds. It will be expected to go from its present 50 seasonal employees to 63 full-time employees. This company, from a traditional economic sector for our area, has involved their production methods into new markets. By doing so, they have ensured a bright future for the company and its employees, and I thank them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For Sackville Cobbequid. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to make special mention of four students and their teacher advisor from Sackville High School in Lower Sackville. Andrea Chisholm, Justice Snow Thompson, Madison Gass, and Jessica Humphrey, along with their teacher advisor, Louise Mullane, were chosen to travel to Abbotsford, British Columbia, to attend the 35th Annual Canadian Student Leadership Conference. The conference included representatives from 200 schools across the nation, bringing together over 1,000 student leaders and teacher advisors to work together to bring positive change to our schools and communities, which was the focus of this conference. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me congratulating Andrea, Justice, Madison, Jessica, and Louise for representing Nova Scotia and Lower Sackville at the 35th Annual Canadian Student Leadership Conference and wish them continued success in their studies and teaching this year at Sackville High School. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Preston Dartmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize Alex Lawry of Mineville, who has honed the craft of baseball umpiring at the Minor League Baseball Umpiring Training Academy in Vero Beach, Florida, which resulted in a contract with the Gulf of Coast League. He can, in six to ten years, work his way up to a AAA and then possibly the Major League. He started umpiring a mosquito and peewee at the age of 13 progressing at the age 18 to work in Nova Scotia Senior Baseball League, the highest level of baseball in Atlantic Canada. I recognize and congratulate Alec Lowry for his achievement in this high level of professionalism and wish him every success in the future. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to bring recognition to the Environmental Services Association Maritimes for encouraging growth, communication and collaboration among industry and government. Networking, marketing and social events are important to ESAM. Recently, I had the opportunity to participate very badly in the fourth annual softball tournament. Many of the association members filled four teams. It was a great way to build teamwork and communication. ESAM is looking forward to the 2020 tournament and anticipates increase in participation. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in recognizing the ESAM Maritimes board members, Chair Tara Oak, Treasurer Terry Thibodeau, Secretary Peter Fleming, and Directors Derek O'Coin, Sean Bruchette, Janetta Frazier, Midori DePonte, April Bro Boudreau, Michael Doucette, and Nora Doran for their hard work and dedication to the environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Guysborough Eastern Shore, Trackety. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in recognition of the 50th anniversary of service for the Alls Cove Fire Department. The Alls Cove Fire Department is dedicated to providing the best service possible to the community of Alls Cove and surrounding area. Its members put in many hours of training and volunteer time to ensure that they are able to protect and serve the community. Alls Cove is a wonderful community. It's full of great people, like those who volunteer at the fire department, and it deserves the exceptional level of fire, rescue, and emergency services and support it receives from the Alls Cove Fire Department. But the fire department is much more as well. They host pancake breakfasts with a team of excellent cooks, engage in fundraising activities, and provide support to teams, community groups, and local initiatives. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to extend my sincere congratulations and commend the Alls Cove Fire Department for their achievement of this exceptional milestone and their commitment to community safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, the success of the Inverness Development Association has been a rewarding journey. Last summer, they celebrated the accessibility of the Inverness Beach for people with physical challenges. It was a positive moment, and it resonated in the hearts of people around the province. They won a Human Rights Award for that. This year, the Inverness Development Association celebrated 50 years of service to their community. It has made a difference for many. Today, Inverness is thriving and starting to grow again. These achievements happen because people, like the IDA board members, took the initiative to help make things better. People are proud of Inverness and what the Inverness Development Association has accomplished. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seated in the, in the gallery behind me today, we have a group of Crown Attorneys that are in town today for some professional developments, and they're here taking in the proceedings. 
I'll read off a few of the names I have, and then maybe they can all stand and receive the warm welcome of the House. We have Gerald McDonald, Darcy McPherson, Mary, Mary Ellen Nurse, Paul Trisdale, Vicki Doucette, Christine Driscoll. I actually went to high school with Christine. Uh, Janice Ray, Eileen McGinty, Leanne Bryson, Stacey Gerard, Sylvia Dermarski, Janine Kidd, Sharon Goodwin, Gail Carding, Jennifer Mickelson, Adam McCauley, Misty Morrison, Alex Cavini, Sean McCarroll, Jamie uh, Van Mart, Terry Nickerson, Eric Taylor, Melanie Perry, Scott Morrison, Ronald Levesque, Perry Borden, Thomas Cater, Sarah Kirby, Michelle McDonald, Sarah Wilson, and a bunch of other ones. Please stand up and receive these. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, we have not spoken much in this chamber during this session about forestry practices across Nova Scotia, but many Nova Scotians are, in fact, continuously in conversation about the correct balance in the woods, the importance of woodlots and forest-related work for the incomes of so many families, and on how we must first protect the ecological integrity of our forests, be they on Crown land or private woodlands so that we can continue to rely on them for economic and recreational values, as outlined in the Leahy Report. This Saturday, there is a unique opportunity to experience ecological forestry at the Otter Pond Demonstration Forest in Mooseland, which is partnering with Hike Nova Scotia for a fall field day and guided hike. I encourage anyone with uh, an interest in ecological forestry or just a love of the woods to consider taking advantage. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Armdale. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Michael Toker, a resident of Armdale, on opening his new business. Michael is tremendously accomplished in the kitchen. He has worked as a chef at Pete's Fine Foods and most recently was the executive chef at the Halifax Exhibition <coughs> Centre. In early May, Michael took a big new leap by founding and opening Yes Chef Bistro in Bedford. Michael's restaurant is styled as a Canadian bistro with a Mediterranean flair. For residents looking to eat in or take out, there's no shortage of delicious options from burgers and seafood, casseroles to moussaka and kofta. With a great team and his culinary skill, Michael executes a menu that offers both great variety and consistent quality. Michael and his wife Lucia recently announced they are expecting their first baby in the new year, a welcome addition to Nova Scotia's numbers. I ask all members to join me in congratulating Michael and Lucia and wish them well with their growing family and business. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to recognize every farm business in Cumberland North and throughout all of Nova Scotia. Today is World Food Day, and the United Nations goal of achieving zero hunger is not only about addressing hunger, but also nourishing people while nurturing the planet. We have much work to do right here in Nova Scotia as we import 87% of our own food, and many families in our communities go hungry. Today, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank all farmers in Cumberland North, including my father, who's farmed for 56 years, my 21-year-old <coughs> sister, Lauren, dairy farmers Charles and Cindy Smith, and Fred and Angus Cameron. Mr. Speaker, did you eat today? Thank a farmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to recognize Natalie Leonard, a civil engineer and founding partner of Passive Design Solutions located in Hubley. This innovative company that has been in operation for 10 years is designing in homes that reduce energy consumption by 65 to 80 percent and has just launched a new line of stock plans that will reduce both construction time and costs. Passive Design Solutions has a passive or net zero host located in Hubley. The net zero means the host is able to generate as much energy as it consumes. So in the warmer months of the year, when the host generates more energy than it requires, the excess energy is sold back to the grid. Over the course of the year, energy consumption balances out as the need for energy is equal to the energy that it is produced. Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of the House to join me in congratulating Natalie on her business ideas and for featuring new methods to fight climate change, help families control their energy costs, and for her contributions to protect the environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queens, Shelburne. 
Mr. Speaker, Liverpool's Lauren Amaro was a participant in the Queen's County Musical Festival every year from the age of five until she graduated in June from Liverpool Regional High School. In the 2019 festival, Lauren competed in eight disciplines and she was recommended by the adjudicator to perform at the Nova Scotia Provincial Music Festival in both piano and musical theatre. She was then chosen to join Team Nova Scotia at the National Music Festival in Saskatoon in August of this year. Performing in the musical category, theatre category, Lauren did Queen's County proud. Mr. Speaker, I am so pleased to offer my congratulations to Lauren on her achievements. Her musical talent and love for the arts are admirable. I wish her all the best for a promising future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Mr. Speaker, I'm always eager to share news about innovative members of my community with you in the House. Jesse Dale is one such individual. As the coordinator of Halifax's mobile food market, Jesse recognized that many low-income seniors in Halifax were unable to access fresh, affordable produce due to physical and economic constraints. As a result, Jesse began accepting food orders from seniors in North End, Halifax and Fairview and delivering fresh fruit and vegetables to them bi-weekly. Jesse also realized that there was an opportunity to connect cultures and to provide Syrian and Middle Eastern youth with their first-time job. These youth are recruited by the YMCA and are tasked with organizing the produce into customized orders. Because of her incredible work connecting cultures and battling food insecurity, Jesse was recently honored with a national award from the Bihana Family Foundation. I'm so proud of Jesse and all that she's done for our community and beyond. And so today on World Food on World Food Day, I ask the members of this House of Assembly to join me in thanking Jessie for all of her incredible work. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Ryan Reynolds, a Spring Hill native who goes above and beyond for his community. During the rec recent East Coast Athletic five-man scramble tournament at the Spring Hill Centennial Golf Course, Ryan Reynolds was recognized and thanked for his support of the club and the young people of the community. Ryan does so much for the community and the youth and is dedicated mentor to them. Whether it's in the rink, at the ball field, or in the gym, he is a solid mentor, always available to offer advice. Ryan grew up playing golf at the Spring Hill Golf Club and is now giving back to ensure the children will have a safe place to have fun and spend the day doing something they love. I ask the House to join me in recognizing the dedication and selfless volunteer hours that Ryan Reynolds has given to his community and wish him much success in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaverbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased and proud to rise today to recognize Emily Alford of Beaverbank, who is well known by many of the MLAs here to, today. This year's uh, Canadian Junior Girls Dart Champion. Emily recently completed at the WDF Darts World Cup in Romania. Mr. Speaker, Emily's finished the competition with a 16th place world ranking. Emily was very proud to be part of the Team Canada and makes sure everyone knows that she is from Beaverbank, Nova Scotia. Emily is very engaged with her community and Beaverbank and is proud uh, to support the Chair Emily on. Mr. Speaker, I uh, request that all members of the Legislature to congratulate Emily and best wishes for next month's competition at the DBO World Masters in England. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in our province, when an injured worker has been declined benefits through the processes of WCB, they can appeal. Caseworkers, hearing officers, WCAT often become involved. The process can literally take years to complete. The injured worker in each level of appeal has 30 days to file the necessary appeal. However, WCB has no time limit on their decision-making processes. Why do we have such an incredibly different set of rules? Injured workers can wait for several months to have their appeal dealt with. Why does WCB have such a backlog of their internal appeals process? Is anyone aware of the impact that the injured worker experiences every day awaiting a decision from the WCB? Perhaps it is time to overhaul the Workers' Compensation Board, its mandate, and re-examine the WCB Act, which should be in existence to assist the injured workers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much for those member statements. We'll now await the hour of question period.
We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We learned this morning that 16 elective surgeries at Cape Breton Regional were cancelled in the last week alone. I'll table that <coughs> document. This is, of course, on the heels of reports uh, of adult inpatients being admitted to the pediatrics ward uh, during the same time period at the same hospital. When we raised these uh, issues with last week with the Premier, the Premier said, we just can't think about today. I'd like to ask the Premier, how many todays do we have to live through until we get to tomorrow? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honourable for the question. Uh, he would know as we've been going through this issue of uh, transforming our physical infrastructure around health care. It actually is about the next 50 years. Uh, Mr. Speaker, at the same time, he would also know one of the issues that's been associated with has been hospitalists when it comes to the regional hospitals, as well as those rural hospitals outside. Uh, we're ongoing negotiations with Dr. Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker, to deal with that issue. Uh, we've had some po positive progress. Uh, we're hoping to be able to have some report to, in the not too distant future. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. The issues are here today, Mr. Speaker, and the Premier can reference the ongoing negotiations, but everyone in this House knows how the Premier negotiates. Uh, many of these people have been waiting years. They've seen specialists, they've been on wait lists, and then finally the day of the sur surgery is circled on the calendar. Just when it's almost here, Mr. Speaker, they get a phone call that says, sorry, we have to cancel. Imagine getting that call, Mr. Speaker, but also imagine making that call, knowing what you're doing to that person's life. What comfort can the Premier give to those frustrated Nova Scotians that have had their elective surgeries cancelled time and time again, especially in the last week, 16? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, uh, we uh, share the frustration of those Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, who have had uh, surgeries cancelled. Uh, we want to tell them uh, we're continuing, Mr. Speaker, to deal with the physical infrastructure that has been part of those delays. Uh, the honourable member would know uh, there's been delays when it comes to delivering surgery in this province for quite some time. It's why we've made the largest single investment in healthcare infrastructure in our province. It's why we're going to continue to do that, Mr. Speaker, and it's why I look forward to continuing to work with Doctors Nova Scotia to respond to the needs of those physicians. The honourable leader of the official opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has been the Premier for six years, and yet for the first two years of that, there was no effort on recruitment and retention of doctors. We are reaping the rewards of the Premier's own strategies around health care. They're here today, and the Premier doesn't want to acknowledge me, likes to look out into the future, but they're here today. And I'd just like to ask the Premier very simple, simply, why is it okay with him that surgeries are being cancelled today? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member in this preamble is not accurate. Uh, there's been ongoing recruitment with inside of uh, Nova Scotia health care facilities. Part of the early part, Mr. Speaker, was done by the Department. It transferred over in the transformation around health care, uh, Mr. Speaker. But what he, what he is denying, Mr. Speaker, is the issue around physician uh, resources is not unique to the last six years, and it's not unique to Nova Scotia. What we're reaping, quite frankly, is the fact the last time the Conservative Party was in power, they built huge administrative structure, Mr. Speaker, and did nothing, and did nothing to ensure that we built a health care providing service that was going to attract and retain health care providers today, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the Premier about housing, not uh, abstract housing policy, but people's concrete situations. A woman named Christina Border has given me permission to speak of her situation. Christina had a two-bedroom unit in a triplex in Armdale. She was paying $12.95, and she was informed by the landlord uh, that uh, he's going to turn the unit into an Airbnb and that she would have to move out. Uh, however, she would be able to stay if she would pay $2,000. Mr. Speaker, that's $705, over a 50% increase. Uh, now, people say very commonly when they're dealing with these kind of situations, they'll say, what am I supposed to do? So I want to ask the Premier, what is somebody in Christina's situation actually supposed to do? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the Honourable Member for raising what is a, an important issue, not only facing Christina, but many members, Mr. Speaker, as we continue to see the growth uh, in the economy, in particular in certain parts of our province, particularly in Metro, Mr. Speaker, are putting pressure uh, on affordable housing and units. Uh, we continue to work 
uh, with landlords, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we have the affordability in all parts of our city. We know there's more work to do. We look forward uh, to working uh, with the national government and the $400 million of it set aside to, to make, ensure that we have affordable housing, continue to make sure uh, that we have rent subs that are available to support those in communities, and we'll continue, Mr. Speaker, uh, to make those investments and work uh, to try to uh, work with, as we see this growth, to make sure that people aren't being left behind, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, I'll provide the details of the housing, but not the identity of a second person who has also given me permission to speak of his situation. He lives in a low-rise rental building in the south end of the city, where he just lately got a notice from the landlord that the rent for his one bedroom will be going up $275 a month on December 1st. That's about a 30% increase. And tenants in this and several other buildings uh, owned by the same landlord have received similar letters, uh, and they are in no more than he is in a position to pay this kind of increase. So I want to ask the Premier, where are these people supposed to go? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I thank the gentleman for the question. Uh, he would know uh, part of the pressures that is happening, Mr. Speaker, is the short-term rentals is happening not only in this province, but it's happening, Mr. Speaker, globally. Uh, we're seeing pressures on the housing market. We continue, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, to work with ensuring that we're providing uh, housing options uh, in communities across this province. Uh, he raises a very important point. Uh, it's why we've continued to make the investments we are. If you, the, the most recent investment is proving our own housing stock, Mr. Speaker, across the province, uh, to bringing it up uh, to where people want to uh, live in those facilities, working with uh, developers to ensure that we have uh, affordability in housing stock across the province. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, again, providing rent subs that will allow families uh, to, with affordability. And as I said to the honourable member, and I committed to the honourable member, we'll look to find out whether or not that needs to be adjusted uh, in the coming months. The honourable leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, look, uh, Sobez Benjamin spoke here uh, downstairs this morning about his family's situation. Their apartment in the North End had been damaged in the hurricane and they have to vacate that building. Building. He spoke about how anywhere comparable uh, in his community in the north end of the city is hundreds and hundreds of dollars more expensive and that how his family is not sure where they're going to go. Mr. Speaker, what is the Premier going to do about all these people in Nova Scotia who are being squeezed so harshly by exploding rents? The Honourable Premier. Again, Mr. Speaker, uh, there's a number of factors at work here, Mr. Speaker, as he would know. As I said, the short-term rental issue has been growing not only in this province and this city, but quite frankly across the country and globally. Uh, we continue to work with landlords around affordability, make sure we have affordable uh, combinations in, in uh, parts of the city. Uh, he would also know uh, HRM is actually working towards an affordability model uh, in the city here. We've seen other municipalities working with the province to provide that same option. Uh, we're looking at our own housing stock. Uh, the most recent budget that we introduced had another 1,500 rent subs that were in it. Uh, those are trying to deal with the issue to support, uh, Mr. F Mr. Speaker, those families who require our support. Donald Leader, the official opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When the, when the text line for Kids Help Phone was launched, Nova Scotians reached out to discuss suicide more than users from any other province or territory in Canada, and I can table that. Young people in Nova Scotia are having thoughts of suicide more than young people anywhere else in the country. And yet the wait lists for youth and adolescent mental health services remain high across the province. I'd like to ask the Premier, is knowing that young Nova Scotians are discussing suicide more than anyone else in Canada, what action is the government taking? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, he would know we continue to make investments in the helpline. He's referring to uh, uh, Mr. Speaker to reach out to those citizens who require support. He would also know that we continue to increase uh, the Schools Plus program uh, that provides a wraparound service uh, not only to that youth but also to support uh, uh, Mr. Speaker for their families. We continue to see uh, investments in around mental health. He would also know. Uh, we had a, uh, an expert panel that is providing uh, mental health uh, options to our province that we've taken 
um, continue to make investments in each one of our budgets, continue to make investments in uh, mental health issues, Mr. Speaker. This is an issue that is facing many of our families, all of our communities. Uh, we continue as a government, as I, I think all members of this House do, understand the severity and recognize the importance of early intervention in this sport. But what our expert panel was clear to say, Mr. Speaker, is that our decisions and our investments need to be evidence-based. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, the the statistics around young Nova Scotians discussing suicide are very troubling. Um, but it's also very troubling that we have some of the highest child poverty rates in the country as well. And maybe those two things aren't surprising to some people, but they're they're just surprising to me. Uh, the minister, the minister of Community Services, said that she finds the poverty rates surprising and they flew in the face of the remarks of what she thinks to be true in the province. I could table remarks on that. But the fact of the matter is far too many children in this province are living in poverty and there is a direct connection between poverty and poor mental health and I'm grateful that the Kids Helpline is there uh, for those that reach out in the face of the long wait list that we see. But I'd like to ask the Premier, what does the Premier think that the high rate of suicide discussion indicates about the state of mental health services in this province? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member raises an important issue. It is around poverty, Mr. Speaker. How do we support those families that are in need, and how do we make sure that we keep our province in balance and continuing to grow to provide economic opportunity? Mr. Speaker, part of that path is to ensure that we are signing affordable contracts ones with the public sector who are the best paid, Mr. Speaker, in this entire province, so that we can make investments, Mr. Speaker, when the, we had a tax opportunity, we made the basic personal exemption, so it affected the very families that the Honourable Member is talking about. We made investments in youth health programs, the very person the Honourable Member is talking about, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to do affordability around rent subs, supporting people, Mr. Speaker, it's the very families the Honourable Member is talking about. The reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, there are choices to be in this House, and we can't say to everybody, we're going to give everybody everything. Mr. Speaker, the reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, those of us who have the most, Mr. Speaker, need to share with those of us who have the least. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. Thirteen surgeries were cancelled last week, and three more were cancelled yesterday because beds weren't available. The Cape Breton Regional Hospital is overcrowded because inpatient beds at the Glace Bay Hospital are not available for the people of Cape Breton. Family doctors in North Sydney and Glace Bay stopped providing inpatient hospital services earlier this year because they received no stipend for time spent on call. Mr. Speaker, what exactly has this minister done to reopen the beds in Glace Bay that are so desperately needed? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and certainly uh, the member and, and all members of this legislature uh, share a common uh, objective and goal with Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, and that's ensuring that they have access to the care that they need. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, in, in terms of the, uh, the, the challenges with uh, the beds in, in the Cape Breton region, uh, indeed, uh, we understand some of the concerns there have been brought forward uh, through the negotiation process, Mr. Speaker. That work is ongoing and, and progressing well. Uh, at the same time, Mr. Speaker, uh, we work with the health authority and those uh, clinicians on the front line to evaluate what we can do in the interim basis while the negotiations uh, are continuing to progress. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sadly, that's not, that's not helping the patients today. Mr. Speaker, in June, the Liberal government issued a directive requiring that patients be repatriated to their home hospitals as soon as possible in order to prevent overcrowding. How does the minister expect the staff at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital to do this when community hospitals they're supposed to send the patients to are closed? The Mr. Speaker, the minister can talk until he's blue in the face about the redevelopment plan, but the fact of the matter is that there will be fewer beds in this new system than there are now, and we are already, Mr. Speaker, pushed to the limit. Mr. Speaker, with community hospitals closed, are cancelled surgeries and closed admissions the new norm for the regional? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, I uh, appreciate uh, the, the concerns the members bringing forward on behalf of constituents in Cape Breton. We understand uh, the challenges of, of health care delivery in, in, in parts of the province like uh, the Cape Breton region. Uh, but listening, Mr. Speaker, to those concerns of, of, of uh, citizens as well as frontline health care professionals, that's why we are investing in the redevelopment project, Mr. Speaker. That's needed, Mr. Speaker. That was the first thing that I'd heard was the need to double the size of the emergency department. That work is ongoing, Mr. Speaker. Order, as far please. The Honourable Minister of Health has the floor. The Honourable Minister of Health. And Mr. Speaker, we recognize also the need to take steps in the short and the medium term too, Mr. Speaker, to, to support and complement the work that's being done on the redevelopment. That's why we launched the Community Paramedicine Program in Cape Breton Region, Mr. Speaker, to help facility, facilitate the discharge of patients from the hospitals, Mr. Speaker, so they can get back home, get the care they need, free up beds within the system. Those works are underway as well, and we launched that earlier last year. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, walk-in clinics have proven to be an effective mechanism for treating mental illness. In Newfoundland, following an all-party mental health report, opening walk-in clinics dramatically reduced wait times. And in the last few months, walk-in clinics have opened up in Halifax and in Yarmouth. So my question for the Minister is, given the proven success of mental health walk-in clinics, how many of these clinics do we have in the province and how many should we have to adequately address the identified need? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I sincerely thank the member for, for the question on this very important topic. Uh, I can uh, advise uh, the members of the legislature uh, when uh, I became aware of uh, the report uh, uh, from the Canadian Mental Health uh, Association, I believe it was, uh, along with, in partnership with uh, Newfoundland uh, and uh, Labrador. Uh, I uh, reached out to my counterpart to, to get an appreciation, understanding his perspective of uh, the, the work that was done in that pilot program. Uh, Mr. Speaker spoke very positively. I took that information back. I've engaged uh, the department uh, to uh, begin investigating and looking at uh, the opportunities there and what it might mean in a Nova Scotia context. Uh, what I can say is that it hasn't been part of all of the recommendations that we've received to date uh, around mental health over the last couple of years. That wasn't one of the recommendations we had received, uh, so it is something relatively new in our mental health uh, program work. Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Minister for the answer. In June, the North End Community Health Clinic in Halifax opened a mental health walk-in clinic. When the announcement came out, social media erupted in positive praise for the initiative. Before the first patients had even been seen, the organizer of the clinic announced they need to expand service based on the number of people who had expressed interest in utilizing it, and I'll table that. A service that needs to be expanded before it even starts is clearly a service we are in dire need of. My question for the minister is, what are the government's next steps regarding mental health, specifically around walk-in clinics? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, as far as our, our work around uh, mental health and addictions uh, within the province, uh, we work with a number of our partners, the health authorities, Nova Scotia Health Authority, the IWK, our partners in uh, the Department of Education as well, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the fact is uh, we have had a number of uh, reviews and recommendations from uh, experts like Dr. Stan Kucher, uh, representatives from uh, other parts of uh, the province who provide uh, mental health uh, recommendations uh, and indeed our own platform commitments. Uh, this work is all well underway. We've been making investments the last number of years. We're continuing that work, Mr. Speaker, because it is a, a very important part of our health care system and we think it deserves uh, that kind of priority attention. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. A conversation about mental health cannot happen without a discussion on wait times. Wait times that plague the public system in this province are a huge barrier to those in need. In a perfect world, we'd focus on mental health care or on prevention, but with people waiting upwards of a year for treatment, it's nearly impossible to prevent anything. This government has bragged about reducing wait times, but on the ground, the change isn't being felt. So my question for the minister is this. Have mental health wait times reduced or increased in the last 12 months, and where specifically are wait times the longest? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the uh, work that's done uh, around uh, mental health uh, access to care, uh, much like uh, the uh, delivery of health care services uh, for our physical health, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, the uh, health care system uh, recognized that there are varying uh, degrees of acuity uh, and they work hard to uh, identify 
uh, and uh, assess uh, clinically and uh, ensure that the emergency uh, care, whether through physical or uh, mental uh, health, are addressed uh, in the most uh, immediate way, uh, and then urgent and less urgent uh, care uh, following. So as the member uh, looks at our, our website, uh, listing all of the wait times that are publicly available, the only province that provides uh, full coverage of that, you'll see the wait times uh, listed that way. And again, emergency care being provided in real time is the top priority of the system. The Honourable Member for Kings North. I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I have seen the wait times on it, and the new way that the wait times are being reported can be confusing and at times paint an inflated picture of actual progress being made. It's difficult to grapple with what the wait time really is the way it's being displayed. And to be frank, knowing that 90% of people still aren't being seen within the targeted wait time is not comforting, and I'll table that. People on the ground are shocked to hear some of the wait times the NSHA reports them online based on what they've seen in real life. So my question for the minister, is the minister happy with the length of mental wait times in the province, or, and what is being done to meet the targeted times more often? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, uh, I, I, I believe uh, the member's uh, question may have uh, uh, noted uh, where some of his concern is stemming from. Uh, he made reference to confusion over interpreting uh, the information uh, when he made a statement then that followed uh, suggesting that 90% of, of, of people were not meeting uh, the wait time. In fact, uh, what is reported for the wait times is the maximum amount of time someone waits uh, for the 90th percentile. That is, 90% of people are met within that amount of time or less. That's not a, the, the, the indication, Mr. Speaker, that says that 90% of people are waiting that amount of time. It means that people are waiting that amount of time or less. Uh, it uses the highest level. So I just want to make that clarification that that's a worst case scenario. It does not paint a best case scenario for the waits needed for mental health services. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health again. Mr. Speaker, I was disappointed to find out the government hadn't studied suicide statistics since 2004. The study was done by a department that doesn't even exist anymore. It was done before social media was created. And now the minister says a new study is underway, but only because Dr. Stan Kucher recommended it. So my question is this. This topic is so important. It's the kind of thing that isn't complete without first voice input. So my question is, will this be the only suicide study done by this government? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I guess um, just want to want to clarify uh, the work that's uh, ongoing uh, is uh, work to establish uh, a framework that's evidence-based, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that was the, the recommendation that that came forward uh, to uh, learn from uh, the uh, previous uh, study that was done, uh, as the member noted, uh, several years ago uh, to establish a suicide uh, prevention framework for the province uh, that uh, is really looking at uh, the research that's evolved since that point in time that the original uh, framework was in, put in place uh, to see how that would influence and uh, establish the path forward for us in the province of Nova Scotia. That work is well underway, Mr. Speaker. We have a wide variety of, uh, of experts that are providing the input to us on that work. The Honourable Member for Kings North. I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer, Mr. Speaker. In fact, the Minister has said in this House previously that the recommendation for the report came in July of 2017, and they heard from experts in the fall of 2018. The public didn't know this study was going on, let alone had the opportunity to contribute to it. And mental illness is not a problem that can be solved simply by throwing money at it, but that seems to be the approach. My question for the Minister is, the mental health system in this province is broken. People are not getting the help they need when, when they need it. Will the Minister commit to taking on a full study, including public input? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, I, I do sincerely uh, thank the member uh, for the, the opportunity for us to have the, this discussion through the questions, uh, because this is a topic uh, that is uh, so important to uh, all Nova Scotians. Uh, and I believe having these conversations does help uh, reduce the stigma uh, that it is okay to, to engage uh, in. Uh, we do, Mr. Speaker, uh, recognize, uh, I apologize if the member or, or other Nova Scotians uh, weren't aware that we were embarking on the uh, uh, review 
review and updating of a, a suicide prevention strategy, uh, Mr. Speaker. We made it very clear, it was quite public at the time that the recommendation came forward, that we were going to be pursuing uh, these, uh, these steps. So uh, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, the fact is recommendations were made, they were made public, and a commitment to uh, proceed with those recommendations. So uh, the work that's underway is exactly what was committed to publicly. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. According to the United Nations, everyone has a right to adequate housing, but across Nova Scotia, thousands of people are being denied that right every day. More than 43% of renting households in Nova Scotia spend more than 30% of their income on rent and utilities. That's higher than the national average and represents no improvement from six years ago when this government took office. Mr. Speaker, does the minister think that this is an acceptable situation? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member, for the question. Very important topic, Mr. Speaker. We believe that every Nova Scotian deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to work uh, with the uh, agreement we have just signed and with other programs that have already been in place. We'll continue to do what we can to create, to working with our partners right across this province, Mr. Speaker, whether they be private partners or whether they be uh, not-for-profits. We're interested in having conversations with all of those to continue to grow the opportunities for people to call home here in Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, at least the first three years of the bilateral agreement on housing is not going to create new housing stock in Nova Scotia. We need a plan to ensure that people have affordable places to live now. We need to set goals and establish targets to meet them. Can the minister be honest with the House and tell us how many households Order, will be spending— Order, please. like to remind the honourable member for Halifax, Needham, inferring that any member of the House is not honest is unparliamentary, and I'll ask you to retract that. And the Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. I retract that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister share with the House how many households will be spending more than 30 per cent of their income by the, on rent by the end of this government's three-year action plan? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I thank the Honourable Member for the question. It is uh, certainly a, uh, a very important issue for for this uh, government in this province that we continue to do everything we can to create options for affordable housing. She's mentioned the three-year action plan, uh, Mr. Speaker, that is uh, investing uh, $88 million of matched dollars, Mr. Speaker, between the national government and our government, along with an additional $70 million, Mr. Speaker, by the province of Nova Scotia that is unmatched, that will help more than 5,500 Nova Scotia households, Mr. Speaker. Currently, Mr. Speaker, we have 17,000 people who call home uh, living in, uh, in uh, public housing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we will invest also uh, from that first three years heavily in uh, making sure that each and every one of those 17,000 continue to have a place to call home. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Health. When a patient who is suffering severe mental illness requires a psychiatric assessment under the Involuntary Psychiatric Treatment Act at the Cumberland Regional Health Care Centre, they must leave our facility and go to another regional hospital somewhere in the province. We do have psychiatrists, three of them, practicing in Amherst, but due to regulations, they're actually not allowed to do the psych assessment at the Cumberland Regional Health Care Centre. So my question to the Minister of Health is, would he consider adding Cumberland Regional Health Care Centre to the list of facilities able to do a psychiatric assessment? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, the regulations uh, around uh, the uh, IPTA um, uh, assessment uh, process uh, predate me by a significant amount. Uh, I would have to look uh, more closely to see uh, the, the rationale uh, behind it. Uh, I suspect, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I just have to verify whether they can't do any, or if it's just if a patient is there, uh, and, and I think my understanding is that they, they get assessed elsewhere in part because of the, the people making the recommendation. They do need the IPTA assessment done separately because it is that check and balance. So it's about putting a separation between kind of the referral uh, and the actual assessment for the individuals. I, I believe that's where it's at, but I have to go back and, and double check to verify. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, I'm, and I thank the minister for his answer, and I know it's, it causes a lot of undue hardship on both 
the patient as well as the families of the patient because often they are sent to another facility and then sent home immediately after, but the proper supports, because they're assessed in, at Kenful or Turo, the proper supports are not always set up back home. It's also undue hardship on our emergency room physicians and nurses who often spend hours on the phone trying to find an available bed at a regional, at another facility. So I want to thank the minister and again just ask if he would be willing to take a look at that regulation and ensure that Cumberland Regional could be added to the facility list under the Involuntary Psychiatric Act. Thank the you, Honourable Minister of Health. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and, and certainly I'm, I'm uh, absolutely willing to take a look at that to understand uh, the circumstances there. Uh, indeed, uh, this uh, particular uh, piece of legislation is a very important part of legislation uh, for uh, those Nova Scotians uh, who... Um, may not realize that they need help yet, um, but uh, that uh, loved ones and, and clinical staff uh, have come to the realization that that, that, that kind of care is needed. Uh, so again, uh, it is certainly uh, my desire to ensure that that process works uh, seamlessly, to ensure people get the care that they need uh, and that the supports are there for uh, establishing that. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Uh, speaking of facilities that lack vital services, as we stand today, the Dartmouth General continues to be the only regional hospital in the province without emergency psychiatric services. The situation is different than the one at Cumberland Regional. This problem involves crisis situations, Mr. Speaker, where minutes, even seconds, are the difference between life and death. No matter how many, mil many millions are invested, no matter how many times the issue is raised in this house, so, you know, some people of Dartmouth have to rely on a taxi uh, to get them to a hospital that can help them in a mental health crisis. So my question to the minister is this, when will the people of Dartmouth get the emergency mental health services they need? Thank you, Mr. The Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in, indeed, uh, when uh, individuals, uh, particularly in, in, the, in the, the central area, uh, have a, a mental health uh, crisis emergency, uh, there are uh, other avenues uh, to obtain support, like the crisis uh, teams, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in uh, some instances, they can actually respond and report directly to the individual's homes uh, that they don't necessarily have to show up to the, uh, to the hospital or the emergency department uh, to receive assessments and, and support, Mr. Speaker. In, in such a crisis uh, situation. So uh, there are a variety of options, Mr. Speaker, uh, to receive uh, uh, interventions and, and support through our uh, crisis uh, line. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While I appreciate the Minister's response and the, the list of resources available, let's not forget that in November of 2017, the Auditor General stated that Dartmouth General is the only regional hospital in the province without a crisis uh, response service and no psychiatry support to the emergency department. And I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. Now, in response to that report, the Minister stated that 911 services are always available. Uh, but it's important to remember, Mr. Speaker, if you're in Dartmouth and you call 911, you'll be taken to the Dartmouth General. So I don't think 911 services being available is adequate for someone in a mental health crisis. So my question to the Minister is this, what good is it for 911 services to be available for people in crisis if they are being taken to a hospital without the services they require? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, appreciate uh, the member uh, raising uh, uh, the topic of uh, services uh, being provided at Dartmouth General. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, important that, that people recognize, uh, and, and certainly uh, the feedback from uh, the health care providers as well as the um, uh, people in the community, uh, the investments that are being made there to expand a wide variety of services and programs there from operating rooms to expansion of dialysis uh, programs, Mr. Speaker, making several investments uh, at that uh, particular facility. With respect to emergency services and 911 ambulance uh, discharge, uh, their protocols should be uh, working and engaging, and if it's known that it's in a mental health emergency, Mr. Speaker, uh, they should be uh, responding and bringing the uh, patients to the appropriate uh, facility. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Office of Workplace Mental Health has a website. It has outlined responsibilities and priorities. It has an email and a mailing address. It's an important development that shows that the government recognizes mental health as a priority for its employees across the province. Recognizing the importance of the urgency of positive mental health in the workplace is important. But in order for it to expand outside government, 
employees, it needs a champion. So my question for the Minister of Health, what current evidence-based initiatives are being undertaken to ensure a healthy workplace for mental health? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, I, I thank the member uh, for his, his question. Uh, the fact uh, is, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've taken a, a number of steps uh, to uh, provide supports and, and care uh, for Nova Scotians uh, in our mental health uh, space. One of those, Mr. Speaker, again, following advice and recommendations from uh, from experts uh, in the field and uh, including uh, first voice uh, opinions and, and feedback, Mr. Speaker, on the uh, panel that was co-chaired by uh, Star uh, Cunningham and uh, Dr. Stan Kutcher, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, those recommendations were to focus in particular on youth mental health services, uh, that that was the area that was most critical for us as a province to be focused on, getting that care and services earlier to Nova Scotians, and that's what we've been doing. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. I thank the Minister for that answer. Mr. Speaker, mental health is a work, is a, in the workplace is an important topic, but outside of this partnership, there's a lack of initiative from the government so str on strategically decreasing stigma around mental illness. A strategy focused on the public, healthcare providers, media, youth and adults could make this province a leader in mental health. But as it stands, the last document created to address stigma around mental health was published by a different party almost 10 years ago. As a mental health professional, I think we can and should do better. Will the Minister tell the House that the Office of Workplace Mental Health is developing a strategy to combat stigma in the workplace? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, indeed, uh, the uh, the work that the province has been doing has been uh, well publicized. Uh, the uh, recommendations that have come forward through uh, uh, panels uh, on mental health uh, to uh, the minister, uh, the work of Dr. Stan Kutcher, uh, independent of that, uh, providing recommendations both for the Department of Health and the Department of Education. Uh, we've taken those recommendations, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've uh, committed to uh, moving forward with them. We've uh, taken uh, much action in uh, this regard, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd be happy uh, to provide uh, a document updating uh, the, the member in the House uh, tomorrow uh, on the uh, the status of uh, all of that work, uh, the consolidated recommendations we've had and the progress that we've made uh, throughout the time. Uh, fundamentally, the uh, core of the uh, strategic uh, plan and Together We Can uh, stands to this day. Uh, that work was very well done and I acknowledge the work of the uh, NDP uh, government uh, of the day who did that work uh, for Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Muni Municipal Affairs and Housing. When we have asked the Minister what his government is doing to address the increasing number of families who are being pushed out of housing, he references the bilateral agreement focused on repairs to public housing and rent supplements. Neither of these are enough to help the many residents of Dartmouth North who are living just one bill or family emergency away from losing their homes. One of my constituents lost her minimum wage job and is now facing eviction. Mr. Speaker, what is the minister doing to address the urgent need for adequate affordable housing today in Dartmouth North? The Honourable Minister for Housing, Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. Uh, we have a variety of programs and services that have been in place. We continue to have those in place, Mr. Speaker, along with our uh, investments that we will continue to make. Uh, we know that we need to grow the affordable housing sector, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to work on that process. We look forward to working with our partners. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, last week there were four individuals facing eviction who visited my office in a single day. I have two constituents who are sleeping in their cars, one who is sleeping outside, and one who is sleeping in a tent which her caseworker gave her the money to buy. This is the urgency of the situation. Mr. Speaker, does the minister think it is acceptable that we have reached the point in Nova Scotia where case, case workers are helping their clients buy tents to live in because housing is so far out of reach? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and as I said, we'll continue to work with uh, all of our partners uh, right across this province here in the HRM, CBRM, right, every municipality across the province that has these kinds of challenges, Mr. Speaker. We do have housing support workers out there who have been making a difference, Mr. Speaker. Last year here in the HRM, they helped place and find homes for over 1,200 constituents, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New mothers bring the gift of life and should be supported. But mothers, yes. But mothers and babies currently in the province of Nova Scotia no longer have 
prenatal classes they, that they can attend, nor do all mothers have postnatal in-home visits. These prenatal classes and in-home visits provide education and support to new mothers in various areas like breastfeeding and, po and dealing with postpartum depression. In Canada, a quarter of all mothers report feelings of postpartum depression or anxiety. And in Nova Scotia, it's even higher. And I'll table this report. 31% of all new mothers report feelings of postpartum depression or anxiety. It's a scary time my constituent, Angela Wilkins, knows all too well. My, my question to the Minister of Health, is he willing to consider reinstating prenatal classes and in-home visits for all mothers in the province of Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, the member is, is correct uh, on the on the important uh, role uh, of, of mothers and uh, the, uh, the the significant uh, and important role that they play in in the lives of of, of the next generation. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, uh, the work uh, that uh, the health authority, the programs that the member uh, has referenced, are programs governed by our health authorities, both the IWK and the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Uh, they uh, continue to evaluate uh, how they deliver uh, pre- and, and postnatal care uh, to Nova Scotia uh, women uh, and uh, their uh, newborn uh, children. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, I defer to uh, their expertise in regards to programs that they bring forward uh, for implementation. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The reality is our province are not supporting new mothers like we should be. Angela Wilkins found it the hard way because there was no supports in place for her when she was struggling with postpartum depression. In fact, she went to our mental health department who sent her to a family support centre, which in turn there had no specific supports for someone with a serious diagnosis of postpartum depression. I believe, Mr. Speaker, with 31% of our new mothers reporting postpartum depression, this should be made a priority for this province. Thankfully, Angela, be, having been a registered nurse, was resourceful and sought out her own supports. My question to the Minister of Health is, during his evaluation with his staff, would someone from his department be, be willing to meet with Angela to discuss strategies to make sure that new mothers are part of this evaluation process? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I hope uh, the member uh, feels uh, confident in the uh, support and, and the work that I and my office uh, provide to all members of the legislature uh, to support their constituents when they uh, have, have challenges navigating the health care system. So indeed, uh, certainly uh, she's welcome to, to reach out. Uh, the member knows how to get a hold of me and uh, share the information and, and uh, privacy uh, waiver information uh, to us, or, or at least the direct contact information that we can get that information directly uh, from her constituent and uh, again on this and, and many other issues uh, we engage with Nova Scotians uh, uh, again I hope my colleagues uh, do recognize if we ever run into challenges where, where, where the, the, the support hasn't been uh, there for them please let me know but uh, as I understand uh, we each and every day endeavor to support all Nova Scotians uh, regardless of, of where they live uh, in, in issues like this that they experience. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Mr. Speaker, last week I was only able to ask a, ask a portion of my question to uh, the Minister of Health, so I would like to uh, continue that today. I'd like to thank the Minister for the additional two physiotherapists that are working at Cobbacoot Health Centre as a result of the 2017 orthopaedic plan and the investments that were made then. However, Mr. Speaker, applause is too soon. However, Cobbacoot has the largest wait list for service in the province of Nova Scotia. Even the additions are only serving to keep the list from getting longer and are not providing any speedier of service. Mr. Speaker, I ask the Minister again, will he commit to adding additional therapists to Cobbacoot to address the wait list for residents of Sackville, Beaverbank and surrounding areas, even if on a temporary basis? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I, I apologize uh, to the member. I was uh, thinking of the last time he was up and didn't get to, 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 or I didn't have the opportunity to respond to his question. In fact, I did have a, a, a good uh, Thanksgiving with my family, and, and Mr. Speaker, I, I hope uh, he and all the other members here uh, did as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, specifically uh, to uh, physio uh, services uh, throughout uh, the system, again, uh, our healthcare system uh, has many uh, demands and, and pressures on it, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we continue to engage uh, with uh, our uh, clinicians and our partners on the front lines uh, of uh, our operations, Mr. Speaker, to prioritize uh, the investments that we make moving forward. Uh, the investments we've made around uh, the physiotherapy and the orthopedic program is very clearly laid out. We're continuing to run that program and many others, Mr. Speaker, uh, and that work we will continue. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I certainly recognize and thank once again, but I would point out that investments weren't made uh, to this particular department until the issues were raised by constituents. It seems as though all too often the system in place for resource management almost seems ad hoc, and that can lead to a series of band-aid solutions rather than a comprehensive plan. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister is, what system is currently in place to relocate needed health care resources and staffing throughout this province. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it is a, a very uh, complex uh, process that uh, can't be uh, articulated in a, a scant 45 seconds, but uh, I do uh, assure the member opposite uh, that uh, the work, again, operationally, uh, that provides the uh, assessment of the services uh, needed on the front lines of care is uh, the primary responsibility of our health authorities, the Nova Scotia Health Authority and IWK. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, they are the ones who are operating our facilities. Uh, they know where the, the demand uh, points are uh, for services uh, and care, Mr. Speaker. They prepare their business plans and uh, operations to come forward. Uh, that feeds into our global budgeting process as part of the province, Mr. Speaker. I advocate and support uh, the work to get those uh, resources uh, dedicated uh, to programs that we're able to uh, approve and fund uh, for Nova Scotians each and every year. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, many, if not all of us, receive calls as MLAs from low-income constituents asking for assistance to help them make necessary repairs to their homes. Housing grants are available through the government and a person's family income is taken into account to determine if a household is or isn't eligible. This is a reasonable measure, Mr. Speaker, but as the Minister would know, sometimes Nova Scotians are disadvantaged by having incomes just over the line. So my question to the Minister, could he explain to the House how the housing grant ceiling is arrived at that determines whether or not a household would be eligible for a housing grant? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, thank the Honourable Member for the question. He's quite right. We uh, all as MLAs, or most of us, I'm sure, uh, get uh, uh, folks in all the time looking for grants for their homes. This is a great program, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the government, uh, the, the, uh, the repair adaption program uh, for low-income Nova Scotians invests over $20 million annually in, Mr. Speaker. And uh, there is good uptake on this. We know that there is a need. We're very happy to be able to continue that program, Mr. Speaker, uh, going forward. And uh, I certainly appreciate the question around the income threshold that is part of the process. And uh, we'd be happy to look at uh, any uh, case if there's a specific one he'd like to talk about. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for that answer. Mr. Speaker, the Department provides the ceilings for the different areas of the province, but the ceilings can have a large variance in areas or municipalities that are only a few miles apart. For example, the family income ceiling in the CBRM is $26,000, while in Victoria County, the ceiling is $40,500. We know that many constituents that are seniors on OAS are over the $26,000 ceiling and are ineligible for a housing grant, but can't afford to make the necessary repairs, such as replacing the roof, for example. So my question to the Minister is, would his department consider increasing the lowest ceilings so that these necessary repairs and alterations can occur? Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I thank the honourable member for the uh, question. A very uh, important topic. We know that there's a great need out there for this uh, program. We're very happy that it's uh, able to continue and part of the uh, national housing strategy and the action plan. Uh, it was so important to us because this was part of that investment and allowing it to continue, Mr. Speaker. I certainly will commit to uh, looking at how those thresholds are set. I'm not sure, to be perfectly honest with the honourable member and all members of this house, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure why they vary from uh, municipality or region to region, but uh, I will endeavour to go back, look closely at that, and uh, do what we can and report back. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. On September 26, my colleague from Pictou West asked the Minister of Health about the Fitch and Associates report on the emergency health services system. It's the $145,000 report that was due in December of last year. On the 26th, the minister said, and I quote, I had an update a couple of weeks ago that indicated that the report is essentially finished. They are going through last minute data valid validation, verification in the report before it is submitted and I'll table that. It's a couple of weeks for uh, the last minute validation and I'm hoping the minister has the report. My question is for the minister of health. Has he received the taxpayer funded report and will he commit to making it public? The honorable minister of health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member for uh, the question. Uh, thank the, the, the member for Picto West uh, for the original uh, question. Uh, in fact, uh, I did receive uh, the final copy of the report a little earlier this month, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have asked uh, staff to go through uh, the process of reviewing it, uh, uh, essentially uh, the FOIPOP uh, review process uh, to uh, ensure that uh, any of uh, the material that is released uh, publicly uh, does adhere to the laws in the province of Nova Scotia respecting public disclosure of such information. Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We will now move on to opposition business. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call private members public bills for second reading, Bill Number 76, the Rental Fairness and Affordability Act. We'll now call private members public bills for second reading. We'll call Bill Number 76, the Rental Fairness and Affordability Act. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad to stand here today to address our Rental Fairness and Affordability Act that ad addresses a, a need that this government has, has failed to respond to, and that is the need to limit increases on rents in Nova Scotia. The purpose of this bill is to provide meaningful action on the affordability crisis that plagues the Nova Scotia housing market and that is appearing at our constituency offices with frightening frequency and regularity. The Rental Fairness and Affordability Act would do several very important things to protect renters in Nova Scotia. It sets the base rent as that which was in effect for the previous tenant thereby preventing unrestrained rent increases when a new tenant moves into a unit. It would tie the annual allowable increases in rent to the lowest of the following three measures. 2.5%, the Nova Scotia Consumer Price Index Rate, or a lower lim limit set by Cabinet. And importantly, it would allow for a 0.8% rent increase in its first year in effect. These measures would inject some desperately needed balance into the rental market. The Rental Fairness and Affordability Act does allow for rent increases beyond those thresholds, but only in particular circumstances. Rents can be increased by up to 3% above the base limit, where a landlord has done or undertakes to do renovations or add services. Landlords can still apply to allow greater increases if there are exceptional increases in property taxes, utilities, or other expenses. These measures would allow uh, clarity, security, and some important peace of mind to the thousands of renters across the province who are unsure day to day, month to month, whether they will be pushed out of their homes by rent increases that they can't afford. The bill puts forward important measures to protect renters in Nova Scotia, where unpredictable and unsustainable rents have had an outsized impact on families and communities. We in our constituency offices are hearing constantly from people who are struggling to either find housing or who are being faced with eviction 
or unsustainable rent increases. To share one uh, illustrative anecdote, we've heard from the Nova Scotia Community College that several students at their waterfront campus in Dartmouth were accepted into programs at the college and were forced to, to decline after a long search for housing that they could afford. And, and, and they did not find that housing. We hear constantly of tenants being served with colossal rent increases that effectively serve as eviction notices. I'll note that we also, in my constituency office, now advise people who contact us to do everything possible to remain where they currently are, even if the, the, the housing that they are in is inadequate, even if there is conflict or, or some other circumstance which would normally cause them to move. We're saying, no, stay where you are because we can't, we can't undertake to help you find a new place to live. We're just simply not finding units and nor housing support workers who uh, the Premier or the Minister referenced earlier today during question period. Often a tactic of a, a significant rent increase um, is used by landlords who want to turn the unit into a short-term rental, uh, Airbnb. I, I'd say that across, across Halifax, but also in Bedeck, also in Lunenburg, also in, in parts of uh, uh, other parts of Cape Breton and, and places that are attractive for tourists. Um, you know, people are, are doing calculations to see how they're gonna do better. Um, and that is frankly playing havoc with, uh, with people's right to housing. Uh, and other times it's simply used if the landlord believes that the market has, has changed enough that they can maybe find a tenant who is able or willing to pay more for the unit. And it's not hard for the members of this house, even if, if they haven't had those sorts of constituents in their own offices, to, uh, to imagine the impact that this kind of dynamic has on a labour market that is skilled for hungry workers. And uh, something that I was until recently unaware of and which all members of this House may not know is that we actually have rent control legislation in Nova Scotia already. It was in force in the province until 1993 when it was quietly removed by the then Liberal government through an order in council exempting all residential premises from the Act. Our Residential Fairness and Affordability Act brings back this important protection, but also strengthens it. And for the 122,645 households that rent in Nova Scotia, this legislation would make a significant and immediate difference for them. There is much evidence that it is needed. According to 2016 data, 23,645 households in Nova Scotia spend more than 50% of their income on rent and utilities. 30% is considered a manageable threshold. In the federal riding of Halifax alone, there are 6,440 6, households that spend more than 50% of their income on rent and utilities. That is a whopping 25%, a full quarter of the riding that is faced with this unsustainable, stressful reality in their day-to-day, -day, week to week, month to month budgeting. And uh, you know, in a, on a day when, when many members have spoken about mental health and the importance of mental health, I can tell you I have been approached in the grocery store. Um, by constituents who are um, suffering from deteriorating mental health as a result of precarious housing, housing that they are afraid that they will lose um, due to the dynamic that is happening in the, in the rental market. Restrictions on unreasonable rent increases would make an important difference for people in the riding of Halifax, where 40% of residents are renters. And this is a higher proportion of renters uh, compared to other cities in Canada. For instance, in, in Calgary, only 28% of, rent, of households are renters. Nova Scotia sits um, above the national average for household spending over 30%. Um, over the national average for household spending more than 30% on, on their rent and utilities. 
um, which is the threshold, again, which is seen as, as manageable for households. And, and that means that more people here in Nova Scotia are paying too much of their income on housing than the average across the country. According to housing experts, these numbers indicate that Nova Scotians are, are facing an unsustainable housing situation. And we have learned from data in the 2018 Canadian Rental Housing Index that the Nova Scotia uh, rental market is actually the fourth uh, least healthy in Canada. And if I can find the right piece of paper, I will table that, but I might do it after I finish speaking. Um, families in this province are regularly in the position where they have to choose between housing themselves or buying food and clothing. And, and they're often in a position where they have to forego um, other things that they might want to uh, purchase for their families, such as vacations or, or extra classes for their kids. Despite extensive construction in the last couple of years, number of years in Halifax, which has helped the rental situation to some extent, building is not keeping up with demand and not in the section of the market that is badly needed. Between 2014 and 2017, 5,000 new units came onto the market in Halifax and filled significant demand for largely higher rent units. And I, I would note that um, in buildings that are older, um, it, it has seemed that the, the construction of new units has actually uh, facilitated uh, you know, modest renovations of older buildings uh, followed by um, dramatic increases in rents. In fact, rents have spiked by 19% during the same period, greatly outpacing the rise in incomes. And, and housing intended for, uh, for workers that is affordable for people with middle and lower incomes ha has not increased. All these dynamics together are resulting in renters being pushed out of their homes and in some cases pushed out of their communities. And we hear stories from people um, experiencing this on a daily basis. In my constituency recently, I was contacted by a constituent who uh, works full-time at a hospital uh, um, as a porter in a unionized position. Uh, and she lives in an older apartment building in a bachelor. She doesn't have a car. She's able to, uh, to walk or to uh, take the bus to work. Um, and, and that building has not been significantly refurbished or improved, but it's surrounded by newer apartment buildings. Um, you know, she's given up all the extras, and with the rent increase that she is expecting in January, uh, one full paycheck a month will go to her rent. And on the phone, we went through different options that are available to her to, you know, look at living somewhere that would still be in the community which she has called home for decades, uh, where she would, where she would not be so stressed by her rent payment. And the the only option that I could come up with to suggest was Northwood, where, um, you know, she can get on a wait list for independent living for for an apartment. Um, but my question. The question that I was left really pondering after that phone call was, if a full-time unionized worker is lining up for below market housing provided by a non-profit organization like Northwood, what hope is there for people who are you know, working in the gig economy and don't have the protections of a union, for people on income assistance, for people on disability, for people who are retired and living on a fixed pension, um, and for, for all the other Nova Scotians who are yet in a yet more precarious situation than that constituent who was truly stressed by her housing situation. Um, we know that we know that rent supplements, which the government often uh, speaks of, um, are not working for those in uh, for for those people who are. Um, so lucky as to be assigned one because of the extremely low vacancy rate. In fact, we were contacted by somebody fairly recently who, you know, with his rent supplement was was looking and, and not finding even a basement apartment, even, you know, a, a, in a, a different community, in a much longer commute away from where all of his social contacts are, all of his family are. Um, and, and in this environment where really all the power is with landlords because of the low vacancy rent, rent low vacancy rate, it is, um, 
it, it is increasingly difficult to convince a landlord to even consider taking a rent supplement. There is a certain amount of paperwork involved. There's a certain amount of, of wait time where a unit might be vacant. And they've got people lining up. They've got people lining up. And today I heard about an eight-page application that people are asked to provide to apply for an apartment. Um, so in that sort of circumstance where renters are already, um, you know, being forced to accept high rents, being forced uh, to really make all kinds of concessions to, to find a place to live, um, there's no reason for a landlord to, to work with the province and accept those rent supplements. And that's quite apart from the fact that I, I hear concerns about whether uh, Metro Regional Housing has the, the necessary uh, staff working to even assign and process rent supplements. So, um, for all these reasons, it is abundantly clear that we need real action on uh, rental affordability, and our Rental Fairness and Affordability Act is a meaningful step in this direction. And so I encourage all of my colleagues in this House to consider, uh, to consider supporting it. And I thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Moment and thank the member from Halifax Needham for her words. Uh, I listened intently uh, to her concerns. Um, you know there is a there is a real issue with housing, uh, not just in HRM, which we are aware of as uh, HRM members, but also right across Nova Scotia. And uh, take a moment to recognize all the hardworking individuals at Housing Nova Scotia uh, that work day and night for solutions. And you know uh, they work with individuals like Jim Graham and others who've been involved in this industry or who's been involved in housing now for decades. Um, and they'll tell you that things have changed uh, and they've changed quite a bit. Um, there, are, there are people that uh, advocate uh, for more red subs. Uh, we've seen a positive, um, We've seen positive movement with the rent subs. I know that they're in high demand. Every time uh, this government uh, comes out with more rent subs, as soon as uh, they come out with them, uh, there's usually a waiting list or people demanding for those uh, rent subs. What rent subs does is it gives people the ability to uh, uh, have a bit of freedom on, like you and I, where uh, we can choose where we want to live. People that uh, uh, don't necessarily want to live um, in the public housing stock, but may want to live closer to a school or a family relative. Uh, I've spoken with hundreds of people uh, over my six years, probably close to a thousand people that uh, live in public housing or depend on um, rent stops for uh, for a roof over their head, um, and uh, you know, there's uh, it's a difficult it's a difficult file. It's difficult. Uh, you know, I look at the community of Greystone, which I represent, uh, and the amount of investment that this government has put into the community of Greystone, replacing roofs, uh, spending millions of dollars to replace windows, two uh, playgrounds that were uh, put in the community of Greystone, um, painting, uh, w uh, new walls, new interior, uh, things like that. And when we did that, uh, one of the reasons why we, I pushed so heavily uh, with the uh, current or former and current Minister of Housing uh, was because we wanted people to feel like uh, it was their community, um, that their community was respected by government or was respected by the uh, people around. Uh, we did a lot of public consultation. I personally did a lot of public consultation with the people in Greystone. We actually uh, had very detailed conversations on what work they wanted done in that community, along with uh, what they wanted seen, what they wanted done there, which included playgrounds, uh, which included trees, which included public gardens, which included uh, a basketball court. That let's be honest, these things were. Uh, part of that community, and they were part of that community for over a decade, but over the years and previous governments, these things were let, uh, there, was, there was no upkeep on them, they were let, they were let go. Uh, the the uh, basketball court, the roofs in Greystone, the windows in Greystone, uh, all, these, all the infrastructure was falling, up, falling apart. And people up there were telling me that they felt like previous governments uh, just didn't care about them. Now what we see is we see engaged individuals who care about their community because we went up there, we spoke to them, we had conversations with them about, hey, you know what, uh, what is it that you need? 
And I remember the first time we held a community meeting at Rocking Stone with individuals from Greystone. And, we, and I said to them, along with a couple of people from housing that were there that night with us, when we said to them, what do you need? They were in utter shock because there had pe been people that lived, over there, lived there for well over a decade that had never been asked, what is it that you need? What is it that you want? What is it that will make this a community? And we stand around here and we say, well, this is what they need. This is what they want. And I, I'd like to know if the individuals, all individuals who represent, most of us have public housing in our community, if you've approached the people that live in public housing, if you've approached working class people and middle class people that are struggling day to day and asked them, what is it that you need? And not just assume. You know, one of the things that I've heard from my community, and I've seen it over the years living in Halifax, is the gentrification of these communities. Because we, in HRM, we're in, there's this huge movement for bigger and better and stronger and higher buildings. Um, we're starting to see it in Spryfield. I remember growing up in one of the schools I went to St. Pat's. We saw it in particular in Halifax and Edom in the North End, where uh, it used to be affordable. A family of three could live in the North End in the Hydrostone and not have to pay half a million dollars for a home. You can't get a house in the North End anymore. So my question has always been, what happens to those individuals who have been there for generation after generation and have been pushed out because they can no longer afford to live in the higher stone, because they can no longer afford to live in communities because these massive three, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollar homes are being built around them. So these are part of the, it's not just about uh, rent control. It's a, we need to look at this as a holistic approach. Everybody wants to live on the peninsula in Halifax. And what we forget is living on the peninsula in Halifax is pushing people off the peninsula. And where do they go? What happens to them? You know, people are now, instead of, we're seeing develop, developers now go into communities and instead of looking at, uh, you know, in the past what they would do is they'd look at it and they'd say, how can I make the most money off this piece of property? What can I do to maximize and build these massive homes. But now what we're seeing in housing is they have a massive amount of applications that have come in because of the provincial programs and the federal programs where they are incentivized to build affordable housing. And we have some of the biggest developments going on in my community right now where those developers are doing 10, 15, 20% affordable housing. I attended a uh, announcement in Fairview, um, which used to be ex extremely, extremely affordable. I myself had an apartment there when I was 17 years old. I think I paid $325 a month for that apartment. I challenge anyone to find an apartment for $500 now, let alone $325. But now what's happening is, what's happening now is uh, developments happening all around in places like Fairview, they're happening in the North End, they're happening in Spryfield, they're happening all over, and I can only speak to HRM, I mean, for the rural folks here, I'm sure it's happening all over their communities too. And what's happening is we're pushing these people out and they can no longer afford it. So the actual announcement that I, um, I uh, attended, uh, I think it was last year there, I'm not gonna say the gentleman's name, but uh, I actually went to school with him. Um, he had sold his business and he, he got into development and he had bought one of the older apartment buildings in Fairview. And instead of doing what would have happened in the past, which is, let's gut it, let's make it look as uh, beautiful and as expensive as possible, and let's maximize our rent on this, he approached Housing Nova Scotia and said, okay, what's available? Um, you know, these are communities that I grew up in, I want to make sure that, yes, I'm making my money and yes, I'm making my profits, but I also want to make sure that people like myself and others uh, who struggled growing up, as he had said, uh, have a place where they can go that's safe, that's affordable. Um, and those programs weren't there. They weren't available even 10 years ago, five years, well, I should say five years ago they were, but 10 years ago they weren't available. So I understand um, the the need uh, for this discussion, I really do, trust me. I live in a community where people are, some people are struggling day to day uh, on their rent. We deal with it every single day. 
you know, in my office, we have, thousands, we've, we have thousands of people that come in every year, and housing is a big issue. But I, I don't know, I think what needs to be done is there needs to be a, a larger discussion on how we go about doing this, um, what, what is needed, because what may be needed in um, my community, Spryfield or Prospect or the North End, uh, I suspect there's probably very little room in the North End to actually build affordable housing. Uh, the last time I, I drove through the North End, I didn't see many uh, new buildings being built. I could be wrong. I know the member from Needham... Um, <laughs> but so, and what I heard, what I just heard is the existing ones are going to go, and that's been happening for a while, and that's been happening for more than six years, and that's been, and I'll go back to my original point that the people that I knew that grew up in the North End, when I was younger, it was an affordable place to live. It was an affordable place to live. And it became so desirable that it had, we had an influx of people that moved in there and inflated the price of the homes. I mean, good luck trying to find a home in the North End. Good luck trying to find a home in the South End or in Shibakto or any places like that for under half a million dollars. And I hear it doesn't have to be, right? But so what we, what we need to do is we need to have a conversation with our developers, which we are doing now, which we have been doing. We need to incentivize them for when they build homes, that they don't just build them based on what's going to be best for their bottom line. They, built it, they build it with a social responsibility. And I think of it, another spot where I, I was, there's, there's been all kinds of very good announcements around affordable housing and uh, subsidized rents. And I think about, I was in, um, I think it was down Chester Way, f forgive me for not knowing the exact spot, um, not too long ago uh, on a seniors housing announcement. And it was the third building that was being built by a local developer, a developer who's actually from my community. Uh, and. There was some national press around it because he had received federal and provincial dollars. And I, and I said to him, I said, Let, let's be honest. I said, uh, you're just building this uh, because you got some extra money in your pocket from the feds and the, and the province. And he said, it didn't hurt, but he said, it also made me stop and think about, hey, I have a social responsibility here too. He said, if those programs weren't there, he said, I may not have thought of it. But he said, because those programs are there, it made him stop and think, you know what? There is an incentive to build these, these homes. There's incentive to build these spots. And I will do it. And I spoke to the seniors that were moving in. And they were overwhelmed. They were going to be able to live in an area that was... Uh, for them, they thought was outside their price range. Um, they thought that they would not be able to stay in a place that their grandkids lived, um, their family lived, their friends lived, and that's a big part of it. Um, and because of that incentive, uh, because of that, they were able to stay. And I also look at the partnership with, and it's, I think it's happening in Dartmouth, one of the partnerships that's being discussed with Jim Graham, and I think that's in Dartmouth North, please forgive me, Dartmouth South. Um, and the conversation, Dartmouth North, sorry, I saw Dartmouth South. Uh, but one of the conversations that, was, that we're having with uh, individuals like Jim Graham, uh, who has probably more uh, expertise in housing than all of us combined, uh, and someone I know very, very well, and, uh, you know, I'm sure I'll get uh, some feedback from him just from this uh, conversation I'm having now, uh, is that one of the things uh, that we need to start doing is, is continue to look at co-ops and having um, partnerships with our not-for-profits and supporting our not-for-profits with our private sector. And that's something that we saw uh, with the recent announcement around the federal housing um, announcement, which was close to 400 million over 10 years, uh, and one of the, one of the uh, criterias or one of the uh, caveats that was attached was uh, they wanted to see more, and so did the province, uh, they want to see more not-for-profits, they want to see more wraparound services uh, in these uh, affordable housing areas, um, and allow uh, people to have uh, a bit of ownership. Uh, Co-ops can give you some own, uh, ownership over your surroundings and give you some, um, 
you know, it allows you to lead the direction of the home you're living in uh, and the people that you're living with. Uh, I've se we've seen many successful co-ops, and I think the ones that are most successful over the years and the ones that end up uh, lasting, uh, we have one of the largest co-ops in Nova Scotia right there in the Spryfield area. Uh, but the ones that end up lasting are the ones where uh, they're, they're friends and they treat each other like family. And, and we met not, I met not too long ago with Housing Nova Scotia and the uh, uh, co-op in the Spryfield area. And we met with the members of the board and um, they were overwhelmed by the support they were getting from Housing Nova Scotia. And these are people that had been part of this co-op for, some of them had been part of the original co-op, so they were going back 30 years, 35 years, 40 years. Uh, and they, what they had said to me outside the, when we finished up that meeting is that they had never seen Housing Nova Scotia uh, more eager to help, more willing to give funding, um, and this was a, uh, something that fit them. So yes, uh, we need to look at, I'll go back to my original point, and I do appreciate everything the member from uh, Needham has said. Um, I'm sure I'll hear more. But uh, it, it, there needs to be a holistic approach. So what I would rather hear in closing, instead of one-offs, I think we need to sit down and have a discussion that creates an umbrella for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member from Halifax Needham as well as the member for Halifax Atlantic for their comments. I thank the member from Halifax Needham for bringing up this very important topic. Housing affordability, especially those who are in a vulnerable position, is extremely important. In the housing continuum, we have, uh, we have market housing, we have affordable housing, uh, social housing, which a member from Halifax Atlantic has alluded to. We also have homelessness. We have people who are looking for assistance to get shelter, to get affordable housing. In the last number of years, the economy around here in Nova Scotia, and the, the Premier has mentioned it a couple of times in this session, that it's growing. So we're seeing more employment. We're seeing these things happen. In HRM, and by the way, uh, HRM is more than the peninsula. It is more than the core of Dartmouth. In fact, HRM has the largest rural land mass of any municipality in the province. So there is more to this than just the peninsula. We're all impacted. All our citizens are impacted. When I take a look at Sackville Cobbequid, for example, I don't know if you know this, but the largest affordable housing project was the opening up of the lands in Lower Sackville through CMHC. That was done. My parents built there. And what I see now, and some of the statistics have shown that people who own their own home, about 32% of their income goes towards maintaining their home. Now the people, the seniors who bought those homes and built those homes way back when, have had an income that has not kept up with the maintenance requirements of their homes. So they've got a capital investment and they're going to sell that capital investment and they're going to use that to move into another home. So a lot of seniors in this province are moving to rental accommodations. We have a lot of people who are looking for affordable, good, safe accommodations at all levels of income. So when you take a look at the building, specifically in HRM, it's, it's a wonder to think why there would not be a housing situation now. If you take a look at somebody who has a household income of $100,000, if they spend 30%, that's $2,500 a month on rent. If they want to save a bit more money, they go to someplace else that has a little bit lower, perhaps $1,250. I don't know. But that puts pressure on those who are least able to afford rents. And we can talk about the supplements that we provide. But the fact of the matter is, costs increase to provide safe, affordable housing. And it is difficult to hear that we advise people 
to stay where they are because we don't have a solution. That is not a good thing. So, in our community, Sacco-Cobbequid, we ran into a situation not too long ago, a couple of years ago, in fact, where we found out that homelessness is not unique to the peninsula of Halifax. Some of the services are provided in Halifax, and so we have residents moving there. But we do need to consider not only the housing, the affordability, of transportation, the cost of food, and those people who are able to buy all of those things are in a very fortunate position compared to others who are not. When we take a look at one in four who are spending more than 30% on housing in the municipality of Halifax, and the more, as the member from Halifax Needham indicated throughout the province, you have to wonder where those numbers are going. Why are the incomes of those individuals not increasing? This is not a simple solution. What the member from Halifax Needham in this bill is proposing is that we stop right now the amounts of rent that are being charged. I think that, that is a little, maybe not enough. All right. There's increases allowed. However, that does not help those who are already struggling. It does not help those who are already struggling. How do we help those who are already struggling? What action can we take now to assist those who are already struggling? No, well, how extensive has the consultation been? How extensive has the consultation been with stakeholders? I know that we all hear from individuals who are struggling. How many conversations have we had with others who are providing those services? In HRM, in recent years, we looked at the Housing and Homelessness Partnership and took a look at how we can increase affordable housing stock. So we looked at density, we looked at affordability relative to a new development coming on, and would there be more affordable units provided for in that? In fact, I think there was a point not too recently where Bloomfield School property was looked at and perhaps affordable housing was going to be provided there, and for some reason the, uh, the government of the day did not go through with that. But what can we do? Some of the things that are looked at are even taking a look at single dwellings. How can we increase the capacity in a single dwelling? Maybe we can provide affordable units there through auxiliary suites so we can improve the availability of that. How can we take a look at things like working with organizations like the investment property owners of Nova Scotia and ask what is it they can do? I know a lot of developers who are saying, we want to help. And they take advantage of the low interest rates that are being provided through CMHC and other organizations. And I had a conversation the other day, in the last month, with a developer who said, I am going to build an affordable housing unit. It will have market plus 10% below market and also short-term rental, Airbnbs. How is that helping our citizens who are now struggling? No. We had in Sackville, Sackville Cobb Quid, a warming shelter that was developed last year to assist those in need. What we found is that they needed other assistance. So you look at street navigators, and I know earlier that uh, uh, the NDP had a, had a news conference this morning, and, and both those gentlemen I've worked with in the past to address some of these issues. Who are the street navigators? Who are out there looking at those not only are homeless, but near homelessness, one paycheck away from being in default of their rent? And what opportunity do they have to work with landlords. There are a lot of good property owners and landlords out there, 
who, as the Premier alluded to earlier, said those with much, I paraphrase, are in a position to help those with less. And a lot of owners feel that way, yet there are some who don't, and I think they need to be addressed. So affordability in housing and those less able. We have increased population within this area and more coming. We have immigration happening. We have units, new units being built, but they, the demand exceeds the capacity that's being built. I believe we need to take action now. I do not believe this bill is that action though. We need to take action now, and I do believe that the government has the wherewithal to take action now. You have the action of the existing bill, or the existing legislation, legislation that the member from Halifax Needham indicated earlier, and also to the order and council that changed basically um, the effectiveness of that and the original intent of that. I do believe that government can take a look at that and looking at today's environment, saying, okay, what has changed since the late 90s? Well, one thing is for sure, population, our economy, the low vacancy rates, there are things that we can do now. I believe there are things now that the government already has the authority and the power to do. Mentioned was the, the fact of rent subsidies and those types of things. I question, I was looking for an answer and the Minister of Community uh, Consumer Affairs isn't here. There's something happening January 2020 where monies are being increased and basically the, the recipients are able to do more with that. I hope that the monies, the percentage of those total monies isn't going to help in their rent. I truly hope that that's not where that money goes for affordability. So I guess in closing, I just want to say this. We do have a real need for affordable housing, whether you're making $100,000, $30,000, $20,000. There ought to be some place in there that you have safe, affordable housing, that you can live in a community that you're accustomed to, that you have access to services that you want. And I'm not suggesting for a minute that they all be provided without some work on behalf of our citizens. We need to be able to take a look at what is affordable and am I leaving, living within my means, knowing full well that there's a great, a great portion of our community that that doesn't even apply to. They absolutely do not have the means. How can we help them? Well, we can help them by taking some action and addressing this specific situation right now. And again, this bill I do not believe does it. I do believe though that the government has the ability to take some action beyond what they've already indicated. There are a lot of things happening relative to cooperatives, to affordable housing initiatives by not-for-profits, and that's wonderful. The comment made by the member from Halifax Atlantic about maintenance, or alluding to maintenance. If we allow our housing stock to erode in such a way that it becomes uninhabitable, then we've decreased that market availability, that afford affordable housing. We need to be able to take a look at that. We need to be able to take a look at and reaffirm that those homeowners that are out there can stay in their homes as long as they can possibly do, or can rather. And to do that, we need to maintain the stock that's already out there and help them. And I do know there are initiatives there. So I just want to close by saying again, I thank the member from Halifax Needham for bringing this forward. It is a very real issue. I do believe that there is action required now. I do not believe that it is this bill that will accomplish what at least I'm looking for, which is to be able to do something that helps people immediately and also includes those who are providing the housing stock in a positive way 
and recognizing the residents around that do require the help of government and not just the people who are making 100,000 or 50,000. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to remind uh, the honourable member that it's not proper to refer to any other member who is or is not in their seats in the chamber. The honourable member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, my colleague from uh, Halifax Needham for bringing this forward today. I'd like to thank the other, my other colleagues in the House who have spoken uh, to the bill today, and I just want to begin my remarks with a couple of responses, <laughs> of course, uh, to, uh, to some things that I just heard. Um, uh, my colleague from South Wakabaquid uh, just asked, what can we do? Well, my answer to that is simple, of course. We can pass a bill that controls the uh, uh, increases in rent that are so quickly putting people putting people uh, out of their homes. We can pass a bill that will control rent. It is easy, it is inexpensive, and we can do it. And in this climate of crisis, uh, not just in HRM, I don't think we've ever said that, but all across the province. We have a housing crisis and we are about to have a homelessness crisis, Mr. Speaker. We need to do something. And the government can talk about rent supplements all they want. The government can talk about rent, su rent supplements uh, and how the, they continue to pay money into the rent supplement program. The rent supplement program is excellent for people who have them, but it's not going to help when their rents begin to increase more and more and more, which is happening. <clears throat> the government is happy to put money into the rent supplement program, uh, or, or maybe not, that they say that, they, they say that they're looking at the situation, but it doesn't address the actual issue of rising rents. So that's one thing I wanted to say. Uh, um, and I do agree with my colleague from Spryfield. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> Halifax Atlantic. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you know. Um, uh, <laughs> I do agree with my colleague from Halifax Atlantic who says that there are there is a need for many solutions and and that is absolutely true there is a need for a lot more affordable housing stock. And by the way, the NDP federal platform uh, includes 500,000 new units of affordable housing uh, within the next 10 years. So that is a real ambitious target and can be achieved if only we uh, elect an NDP government, of course. Um, <clears throat> uh, and we do need more co-op housing. And we do need more supportive housing. We need all of those things. But we also need, Mr. Speaker, rent control. It is, it is the number one uh, thing that we could do today that will help somewhat in this crisis. So Mr. Speaker, um, when I was first elected, or when I was first campaigning to be elected in Dartmouth North, the number one thing I heard on the doorstep was rent control, rent control, rent control. Uh, the situation for renters in Dartmouth North in 2017 when I was knocking on doors was desperate. And it was unsustainable, and it's even worse now. Because I know, now that I've been in MLA for two and a half years, uh, when we were helping people in our office, uh, it, the, the issues around uh, housing and rent control, or housing and, and uh, homelessness were never as bad as they are this summer, this past summer and into, into now. In Dartmouth North, uh, where some of the last vestiges of affordable housing in the HRM are dwindling, we have a homelessness crisis that is imminent. And I promised my constituents when I was campaigning to be elected, that I would champion rent control, and I'm very happy that we are talking about it here today, and I will continue to talk about it. But I need the support of my colleagues in this House. We need immediate action, huh? We need immediate action to curb the impact of steadily and rapidly increasing rents in Nova Scotia, and we need to do this to avert a homelessness crisis. The people in Dartmouth North and all over the province are being pushed to the brink. And I would just like to uh, mention uh, what I did mention in, in question period today, Mr. Speaker. Last week in my office, there were four individuals facing eviction in a single day who came into my office. I had two constituents who were sleeping in their cars, one who was sleeping outside and one who was sleeping in a tent that their caseworker bought them. Imagine. It's unbelievable. I also have a constituent, so we're not just talking about 
super, you know, people who are living in super low income uh, brackets. I also have a constituent who lives in a really nice apartment building in Dartmouth North. And yes, we do have really beautiful apartment buildings in Dartmouth North. Uh, and he is a retired teacher. And he's worried about getting, uh, being priced out of his house, his home. And where will he go? I mean, a retired teacher is worried about increasing rents. So if that's the case, like what's happening? Um, as I mentioned, on top of rent control, we need a significant investment in truly affordable housing. We need new units to be added to the market that are affordable. But we also need a definition of what is affordable. Because when a developer on Quimple Road puts up a, you know, a high-rise building and says 10 of those units, oh, wait a minute, that's not actually happening, uh, 10 of those units are affordable, well, maybe they're affordable in comparison to the other units in that building, but they might not be affordable for most people who live in HRM. Affordable is a, is a relative term, and we need to define what we're talking about when we talk about affordable housing. The fact is, is that the recently signed bilateral housing agreement with the federal government will not, uh, will not uh, accomplish these, the, the need for new units. We still haven't heard from this government about how many new units the agreement will add to the market, but we do know it will not be enough to fill the incredible demand for affordable units. In fact, housing experts are skeptical that the federal program represents any real increase in funding uh, across the country. Renowned University of Toronto housing expert David Holchansky has said that the amount of money being spent now by the federal lib liberal government is not significantly more than what the previous conservative government spent. The Office of the Parliamentary Budget Officer also concluded earlier this year that the federal liberal government was not putting any significant new money into housing. Its basic conclusion was that the money in the recent national housing strategy is about the same with slightly less for groups of people with the most needs, but seemingly slightly more pomp and circumstance about how amazing this national housing strategy is. We are forced to wonder where this leaves Nova Scotians who are feeling the housing crunch now. Our Rental Fairness and Affordability Act would make a substantial difference in the rental costs for these households today. We could actually make this happen this week, Mr. Speaker. The vacancy rate in Nova Scotia has steadily declined in recent years, falling by 2% in just the last four years. In Halifax, and this is old data, in Halifax just 1% of available housing units are vacant, an extraordinarily low rate, approaching Vancouver's notoriously low rate of 1%, and Toronto's 1.1% vacancy rate. But the difference is, in these cities, in Toronto and Vancouver, their provinces have legislation that sets allowable rent increases to an annual guideline. These are sensible measures that have not stymied the growth in these cities. They are still attractive cities to live in. And, and it's possible, mostly possible, to live in them. Indeed, reasonable limits on rent in rental increases have allowed these cities to remain viable places for all kinds of different people to live, and the cities continue to thrive as a result. But here in Nova Scotia, in Halifax, we are quickly joining the ranks of these notoriously unaffordable cities, but without any of the comparable protections for renters. Here in Nova Scotia, we are confronted with the deadly combination of climbing rents, extraordinarily low vacancy rates, and virtually zero protections for renters from unsustainable rental increases. We are approaching the edge of an affordability cliff, and this government has a responsibility to take meaningful action immediately, and not just stand up and talk about rent supplements every day, because frankly, it doesn't address the issue. We are also hearing commonly of situations where landlords are using renovations as an excuse to, re to evict tenants from their homes with the real intention of being able to rent at a much higher price. And I know this is happening in Dartmouth. Often tactics such as these, while not truly legal, serve the intended effect of intimidating renters into leaving. These problems are not contained to Halifax or the CBRM. People all across the, the province are grappling with this untenable housing situation and its attendant problems. Recently, I, had, I was in Truro visiting um, with a number of people, but I, I was speaking with the director of the Homeless Outreach Society there. That shelter has 14 beds for adults who find themselves homeless. The director explained to me that she's seen a steady increase, uh, a steady upwards trend in use of emergency shelters in the last several years. And she talked of the increasingly unaffordable and inadequate, and I heard that a number of times in Truro, 
inadequate rental stock that's available to people in Truro. Because there's not a lot of options, people are willing to live in literally unsafe conditions. She explained that people from all over the region travel to Truro to stay at the emergency shelter until they can get back on their feet. She described her fear of an impending homelessness crisis in her community and expressed deep anxiety at the thought of the coming winter as the situation becomes more and more untenable. And I have to say, Mr. Speaker, that I'm feeling that exact same anxiety in Dartmouth North. I am already putting my, heads toge my head together with other people in the community to see what we will do when we find more and more people living in tents on the railroad tracks or living in their their cars and when the temperature gets cold it's going to be bad. In addition to unsustainable rents, we know that one of the key stressors on the housing market in this province is short-term rental uh, conversion. This government has been far too slow to regulate short-term rentals, and this, is having an, uh, and this is having an outsized impact on rental markets across the province. This is why the NDP has also introduced legislation this session that would regulate short-term rentals right now by levying substantial fees and applying commercial taxes on units that are operated as businesses. Our legislation is focused on short-term rentals that are not simply a family cottage or a room in a primary residence. It would require the large lucrative platforms such as Airbnb to contribute revenues toward building affordable housing. It would give municipalities the ability to put further restrictions on short-term rentals that the vacancy rate be, uh, should the vacancy rate be deemed unsustainably low. This legislation would return some much needed fairness to this stressed rental landscape. We know that there are policy tools available to us to address this housing crisis in Nova Scotia. We need aggressive investment in non-market housing built by the public sector. I agree with that. We absolutely need that. This housing needs to be affordable to poor, working, and middle-class people. This can be publicly built housing or supported for, uh, support for not-for-profit private housing, co-op housing, and community land trusts. And when I hear from the government that you know, we're not proposing solutions, I just want to reiterate that we've just, I've just proposed five to address this affordable housing crisis right now. So I'm just going to reiterate those. Rent control, rent control, public housing, support for not-for-profit housing, co-op housing, and community land trust. Five solutions, folks. For example, the federal NDP plan. I've already said this, but I, I, we, the plan is for 500,000 affordable, un 500, affordable units across the country. That would add 13,000 new units to the rental market in Nova Scotia. An ambitious but totally accomplishable plan. We need stronger protections for renters and limits on unbridled renting increases. People who rent deserve to have stability, security and control over their homes and should not face a constant threat of losing their home. Mr. Speaker, we are confident that this is, the one, this is one of the most acute issues that is facing this province right now, and it is absolutely urgent that this government address it head on with confidence and with robustness and with clarity. There is no understandable reason not to bring in rent control. It doesn't cost anything. It won't diminish growth. It, in fact, it will encourage growth. So it does ask me to question why the government won't do it. Our Rental Fairness and Affordable Act is a sub substantial, meaningful, impactful way that we can do this, and I urge the members of this House to support it. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sackville, uh, pardon me, Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Uh, it's my pleasure to get up and rise on this important subject. Um, it is a passionate issue for me because uh, when I first started to run in 2013, as I went through my riding, which is primarily apartments, a lot of high-rises. Um, what I did notice is that the housing stock was the two worst-kept buildings in my riding, and I think that's a shame on government. Um, it's a shame that government allowed people to live in this type of, um, of unit, and I'm proud of the work that our government has done in terms of attacking the bed bug problem in the units, but that's more of a story for another day. What we need to talk about now is affordability. And what we're not doing is actually using facts for our arguments. And here are the facts, Mr. Speaker, and this is proven by every economic theory. When you put rent caps in place, landlords stop maintaining their apartments. And what's going to happen? They're all going to become bed bug infested, oh. leaky, leaky roofs. And this has happened over and over again. And these are supported by facts. Mr. Speaker, the economist has actually said that the way to deal with this is more units to be built. This is a supply and demand issue. But I see the same people who are asking for, hey, let's put rent controls in, but they oppose every building and they oppose any height in this 
in this city or they oppose any density in this city, and that's what we need. The fact that I have 30 poles in my riding and two poles are all of downtown Halifax, because that's how many few people actually live in downtown Halifax, is shocking in a major city like Halifax. It is absolutely shocking. We need more units built. We need them built in the centre core where people want to live, and then they can walk to work as opposed to driving to work. Because right now, what are we doing in HRM? We're expropriating housing to make, to make lanes bigger, which absolutely makes no sense at all, Mr. Speaker. I will also move on to, as we talk about rent subsidies and you know, the importance of them, they do make a difference, and that is one thing that this government is looking at. But Mr. Speaker, I want to talk about the NDP are saying, are using the examples of how this works in Toronto and Vancouver. It has not worked in those areas. Rent has skyrocketed in those areas in the condo market because developers have chosen not to build any more apartments. They're building condos. And what happens is the people who are in, in, in rent-controlled spaces, they stay in them for decades. So an example that's come out of one of those um, jurisdictions is a person who is living in a six-bedroom house under rent control, multiple years. As the years go by, people move out of the house. Now it's one person living in that place by themselves because it's cheaper than going out and renting a one bedroom. That actually takes supply off of the market. In London, in 2005, rents only went up until today by 40% under rent control, but housing went up 110%. The same has happened in Toronto. The same has happened in Vancouver. If you look at those jurisdictions, they're not affordable. We are moving to that, but what we need to do is allow more supply on the market. The fact that a two-bedroom building that was built in the 70s in the South End can get $1,400, $1,500 a month in rent is shocking. But you know what will bring that rent down? Is supply. And as the supply is there, that, that, that building will now start to have some vacancies and the rent prices will come down. So that's what we need and it helps people get into affordable housing. The plans the NDP have have proven over and over again they don't work and they actually, and they actually, they actually exacerbate the problem. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 176, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, an act to amend respecting mental health. The will now call Bill Number 176, the Occupational Health and Safety Act. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's sad that we have to raise in this, in this House to talk about uh, such a terrible situation that can happen in the workplace. And I know, uh, I, well, I hope most of these members haven't had uh, the opportunity to have workplace bullying and harassment um, in the workplace, but this legislation, Mr. Speaker, would actually protect these workers. In Nova Scotia, sadly, we're the only jurisdiction without legislation that outlaws bullying and psychological harassment in the workplace. Addressing this shortcoming is an urgent matter. People in our province are suffering in silence when subject to bullying and harassment in the workplace. Across the country, occupational health physician specialists report that 50 to 60 percent of their caseloads are related directly or indirectly to mental health concerns. And we've heard today, Mr. Speaker, lots of talk and discussion around mental health. And I know when my daughter was in school, bullying, and I know it still is, it's still um, an issue that kids deal with every day. But Mr. Speaker, I also believe that when people go into the workforce, this isn't something that adults should, <laughs> one, should have to deal with or, or or actually do. It, it's, it's, it's very disheartening to think that even as adults we still have to deal with this. In Nova Scotia, we don't have any data on this matter because we don't follow it, Mr. Speaker, because bullying and psychological injury in Nova Scotia are not covered by our legislation. This matter came to my attention when I met Annette Harpel, an Antigonish woman who had been fired from her job at Lawton's in 2018 after enduring daily debilitating harassment from a senior co-worker of, over a period of many months. The situation Ms. Harpel described to me sounded truly unbearable. Her co-worker attempted to isolate Harpel in the workplace and sabotaged Harpel's work efforts, at one point, Mr. Speaker, even shredding paperwork that Harpel had been filling out and she hid it in the trash. Imagine to be that jealous and childish that you have to uh, 
try to bring harm to, to one of your co-workers. Ms. Harpel sought assistance through OHS, where she thought she might get some help and advice on how to proceed. However, her local OHS branch refused her case. Ms. Harpel appealed the Labour Board, and on June, 20, on June 19, 2019, the Labour Board denied her appeal, saying that psychological violence is expressly excluded from this Act. And Mr. Speaker, I had an opportunity to chat, chat with the Minister. Um, about this issue, and even though the minister has has assured me that it is in this act, Mr. Speaker, we can tell you for 100 percent that psychological violence is not covered in this act. And it's it's you know you look you see those commercials of of people being abused, women being abused in battered relationships, psychological violence is just as damaging to a person as physical violence, Mr. Speaker, and we need to protect workers in Nova Scotia. I'm going to read a quote from the decision so that the House can understand what I mean when I say that there are no protections for workers suffering from bullying and psychological harassment under OHS in Nova Scotia from the Labour Board decision. It is acknowledged, and I quote, it is acknowledged that the violence in the workplace regulations apply only to physical violence and threats. The wording could not be more clear, Mr. Speaker. The definition of violence in both Section 2, F, I, and II indicate that it relates only to the risk of physical injury and conduct that endangers the physical health or physical safety of an employee. Mr. Speaker, psychological violence, psychological safety of each and every person who goes to work in Nova Scotia should be of the utmost importance of this government. And the fact that we have to even debate this, that this isn't um, a bill like I would like to call a gimme. Like, wh what cost is this to the government? Wh wh what downfall is this to the government only to show that there, we together are looking out for the for the psychological well-being of each and every employee in, in this province. I lost my spot. Uh, the regulations recognize violence as an occupational health and safety hazard, but they clearly do not encompass the other physical threats, behaviors, and conducts. This is significant in that it indicates that where regulators wished a particular type of conduct to be subject to regulation, they said so clearly. And Mr. Speaker, we in this House should say clearly that bullying and psychological harm to anybody in Nova Scotia should not be tolerated. They continue, we accept that conduct such as harassment and bullying may lead to harmful consequences that have health and safety consequences and that other provinces may have protections that do not exist in Nova Scotia. However, the decision to broaden the scope of protection to include psychological violence under OHS legislation is ultimately a, legis a legislative policy judgment which is beyond the role of a statutory tribunal as the labor as the labor board. End quote. So the Excuse me. So, Mr. Speaker, the Labour Board is clearly telling us that they have no jurisdiction because it does not fall within the guidelines of the OHS Act. And they are telling us, Mr. Speaker, that this legislation has the power to put pen to paper and include this. Ms. Harpel may have had a chance of winning her workplace bullying case in another province. So, if she worked in another province, she would have been protected. That, Mr. Speaker, is a disgrace. But she didn't have a shot here in Nova Scotia because Nova Scotia provides no protection for people in her situation. Had psychological injury been covered by our OHS Act, Ms. Harpel would have, had an ac would have had access to a number of avenues for drawing attention to the hazard in her workplace and addressing the unsafe environment where she spent her working hours. Not to mention, Mrs. Mr. Speaker, how many people are continuing to be bullied and psychologically harassed in that workplace? The bully in her workplace was known to management. Under OHS, she would have had the right to know about this situation. In an effort to resolve the perceived conflict between Ms. Harpel and her bully, management at her workplace 
pulled her into a mediation session without any notice. <coughs> Excuse me. Under OHS safety, she would have had the right to participate in the decisions about what the employer could do to make the workplace safer, rather than simply being told by management to suck it up. Mr. Speaker, that is, I know I say the word disgraceful a lot, but that's, that is beyond disgraceful. Management has told this woman, this, this employee, to suck it up and get on with it, when in fact she was being abused in the workplace. Instead of sustaining psychological injuries because she was afraid of losing her job under OHS, she could have had the right to refuse. Mr. Speaker, which is the right of every employee who is being, who, who feels unsafe at work that they can, um, they can use their right to refuse. But because Ms. Harpel was, is a single person, she was in fear of not going to work because she needed the money and she did not have the protection of OHS to, uh, as a right to refuse unsafe work. She didn't have access to any of those rights because bullying and psychological injury are explicitly exempted for our, from our OHS legislation in Nova Scotia. So psychological injury and bullying is exempt from our legislation. So we, we need to think about that on all sides of this house and if it was somebody that you represent somebody in your family, a child, an adult, it doesn't matter. It is 2019, Mr. Speaker, and nobody should be afraid to go to work. People go to work not because they have nothing better to do. People go to work because they need to feed their family, and they should not have to be put in danger. And again, Mr. Speaker, I will say that danger doesn't just come with the threat of violence or, or shows itself with a bruise. Mr. Speaker, psychological violence is just as damaging as some, somebody who has a broken arm. We are the only jurisdiction in Canada that retains this sort of provision. On this issue, we are, we are dragging our heels, Mr. Speaker, and we need to realize that it is the 21st century. Nobody should feel unsafe at work. As legislators, it is our responsibility to ensure that what happened to Ms. Harpel does not happen to anyone else. It is pretty embarrassing, actually, to think that we are the only area that doesn't have this protection. I'm watching you. <laughs> Seriously, like we are the only jurisdiction in Canada that doesn't have this protection. And again, what, 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 what's the problem? What, why is this not a gimme? Why are we just not doing this, to show the people of Nova Scotia good faith that we have their concerns and their fears, and it's in their best interest, in, <coughs> excuse me, and in our best interest to look after these people. Adding the expanded definition of violence to our OHS Act could provide the hundreds of Nova Scotians who face psychological harassment on the job with the means to address the hazard in the workplace. Mr. Speaker, why would we not want to provide Nova Scotians with this tool? There is no reason that this government, that this House, should not pass this legislation to protect each and every worker in this province. I urge this House to consider the issue with the seriousness it deserves and act quickly to bring Nova Scotia up to speed with the rest of the country on the prevention of workplace bullying and harassment. And again, Mr. Speaker, I will just end by saying that if it was your child, as mine had been <laughs> early on, nobody would stand for that if a child was being bullied. So why, Mr. Speaker, should anybody face these same bullies who are injuring their psychological well-being while they are out trying to make a living in order to feed their family? Mr. Speaker, this is one of the easiest bills um, one of the easiest um, pieces of legislation that I think that we could work together to pass, and I urge this House, let's do this this session to show Nova Scotians that we actually care about their psychological well-being.
I recognize the member for Lunenburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to rise and speak to Bill 176, an act to amend Chapter 7 of the Acts of 1996, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, respecting mental health. Mr. Speaker, safety in the workplace is a concern we all have. And Mr. Speaker, I appreciate that I have the opportunity to discuss this issue. Just last week at my own office, I had a situation where I had to have a protection order placed to prevent um, bullying and harassing of my staff. And um, it's very sad that in this day and age, a politician has to be worried about the safety of, the, of their staff. And I, I was. I was here in, ha in Halifax. My office is in another part of the province. And, uh, my staff had to sit with um, doors locked and um, be really tentative to who was coming towards them. And the only way I had to protect them was to have an order sought and um, delivered to help prevent some act of violence or abuse um, to my staff. And, and this happens all the time. Um, phone calls to my office. Um, can be harassing and threatening, and our staff people often are the they're the front voice of our offices, and they get hit pretty hard sometimes. Um, and I've even had situations where people call my office very angry and threatening, yet when they talk to me, they're they're much calmer. So I think we all have at some point in our life um, been. Um, victims or subjected to types of bullying and harassment, not just in our workplace, but socially, in school, in, in our life at some place. So I do take this seriously, and I'm sure most members here, um, through their experience and talking to people, really know how this can affect people psychologically, uh, emotionally. Um, but we can't predict the behaviors and attitudes of other people, Mr. Speaker. Um, and Bill 176 proposes to alter the definition of violence under the Violence in the Workplace Act by adding situations that do not directly involve the threat of an incident leading to physical injury or a change in physical health in the workplace. So it's talking more about emotional health and, and mental health. And as I said earlier, that's, that is equally as important. Um, this is a preventative bill. Uh, it, um, it proposes that um, it would include behavior harmful to the emotional well-being, self-esteem, reputation or property. And it would include bullying and cyberbullying psychological harassment, racist behavior, sexual harassment, verbal abuse, and the assistance or encouragement of such uh, behavior. So, you know, sometimes there's, you can be in a work situation where there's a tag team, and um, there are more than one perpetrator uh, with the offense. Um, some jurisdictions have expanded beyond physical injury and have included considering uh, mental injury in their OHS policies like Saskatchewan, the Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. Others like Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, Ontario, Manitoba, and British Columbia did not alter the definition of violence in the terms of actual or threatening use of physical force, similar to, to Nova Scotia. Rather, they added additional language with a definition to expand those areas to be considered by workplace in addition to the word violence. Provinces that define both violence and harassment in their OHS legislation, Mr. Speaker, have clearly identified the value to distinguish between the two. Separate legislative and or regulatory requirements have been developed to address them. Adopting a single, all-encompassing 
definition would be inconsistent with this approach, Mr. Speaker. And in Nova Scotia, we have a violence in the workplace regulation in place that requires specific workplaces to conduct violence assessments and implementation and a plan to address hazardous, hazards identified by workers. The proposed amendments do not consider the availability of other existing legislation. And Mr. Speaker, I'd like to table the Human Rights Act that we have here in Nova Scotia that addresses much of workplace safety. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about adults in their workplace. And I think we have to address attitudes and behaviors that are formed in the, in the formative years, and that's between the ages of zero and eight. And we know that attitudes and stereotypes are well established. And from the time of birth to the ages of eight, and also known as the early years. And that's why it's really important that provinces like Nova Scotia put in a pre-primary program, because you have early childhood educators who are well-trained to help children um, develop strong communication skills, which also includes listening skills. And they provide opportunities in these pre-primary programs for children to learn how to make good choices socially, and they also need to learn what are appropriate choices. Not all, you know, you have good choice, bad choice, but also what's appropriate, socially appropriate, like bullying, like harassment. And they learn these skills at a very young age, Mr. Speaker. You need to develop. We all know, and I'm sure any of you who have been the education system or even talking to people. How many children go home from school saying, so-and-so did so and such and such? And the parent says, well, um, what else did they do? Well, they hit me. Well, then hit them back next time. So what are we teaching children at a very young age? Or how many parents have cured their children's biting, a toddler's biting, by biting them back? You know. We have to look at the way we model behavior at the early years and extend it through to the school years. Building resilience is so important. If you look at children today, they're not as resilient as when we grew up. And I'm not saying that you take um, harassment and bullying and absorb it and internalize it. What I'm saying is teaching children how to bounce back from a bad situation or a negative situation and how they move forward in their life and use their mistakes or the mistakes of others as learning experience. And we need to build resilience in our workforce as well. And that's all part of, um, which should be part of workplace policies for health and safety, Mr. Speaker. And our public education system needs to really help children understand that there are harassment policies. There is. Uh, a human rights commission in their province that helps to protect them from situations like that. And last week at, at Public Accounts, we were fortunate to have the um, Commissioner of, of um, Public Service, and I had the opportunity to ask questions about harassment and bullying. And I was really pleased to hear that they are, um, they do have policy, but they're looking at tightening it up and expanding it and being a role model for work, workers and employers in, in Nova Scotia. And I'd like to table some of their um, information that they have available for their staff on their website. And um, they do stress that psychological health is as important as physical health in the workplace. Thank you. And everybody has a role to play, the employer and the employees, to make sure that the workplace is healthy and safe. We need to create respectful workspaces. And I, I'm a little concerned that this bill um, does not 
um, address consequences for people who harass or bully in the workplace. And I, I often think when there's a problem, you need to be part of the solution. So I would have liked to have heard some uh, work on how we, how we address this situation when it does arise in the workplace. Because we can't change everyone's attitudes and we can't change everyone's behavior. We can train them, we can educate them. And we've seen how things like drinking and driving uh, has changed. We've seen how smoking has changed through education. And it works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't work. But um, what, what are we going to do for people who are in the workplace? Are, are we providing enough training? Is there a requirement that if there is a complaint about your behavior in the workplace, is there an, uh, a training program that you must have to take, like sensitivity training? And I know like the public service has many, many programs that are part of their professional development and people can take part in. Um, but there are restorative approaches, and this is where the communication skills that you learn from the preschool years, listening to people, um, being able to articulate and verbalize your concerns, um, and also being able to directly speak to the perpetrator, Mr. Speaker. There's mediation, and sometimes that's an, another positive way of dealing with harassment and bullying. And Sometimes it, it may have to be dismissal of somebody's services in the workplace. So we need to be aware of many ways in which harassment and bullying take place in the, in the everyday lives of people and be open to listening. Employers have to acknowledge that it's going on. I'd like to emphasize again, Mr. Speaker, that Safety in the workplace is of concern and should be of concern to everyone. And both the physical and mental well-being of workers need to be at the forefront of all workplaces here in Nova Scotia. And we know workers can be impacted mentally and physically when they are at work. And it's important to look beyond just the physical aspects of bullying and harassment. And we do, however, recognize the good work that's already being taken here in Nova Scotia with the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. And we want to ensure that workers are protected from all types of harm. We also want to ensure that any changes to legislation meet both the employer's and employee's needs. And that's why they engage with stakeholders on this issue and the Public Service Commission and the, and the Human Rights Commission are both working on stakeholder meetings to tighten up their policies and also their legislation. And we, they've been, uh, the Human Rights Commission has been um, doing juristic, jurisdictional studies around um, Canada seeing what policies are being implemented in different provinces and seeing which ones would really work into Nova Scotia's. And learning from what has worked and hasn't worked in other jurisdictions will help us to create our policies. And we have also engaged the ministers of the, the Advisory Council on the status of women and on um, the labour and advanced education in this area. And um, we will continue to actively seek out consultation and take steps to move forward to make all of our workplaces here in Nova Scotia healthy and happy environments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Sydney River Meyer Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, to stand up and speak to Bill Number 176, uh, the amendments to the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, I think every Nova Scotian, every person, everywhere, uh, deserves a workplace uh, safe from violence. Uh, in the workplace, uh, they should be safe from bullying, cyberbullying, uh, intimidation, and harassment. 
Uh, to speak to this, uh, the intent of the specific uh, amendment uh, that adds bullying and psychological harassment to provide additional protect protections in the workplace. Uh, what I did like about this uh, amendment uh, was the comprehensive definition uh, of violence. Uh, what encompasses violence in the workplace? Uh, specific, specific examples of violence. Uh, what's deemed as unacceptable uh, in the workplace uh, that could potentially impact uh, the mental health uh, of employees uh, in Nova Scotia? Uh, like you said, the definition of violence is precise. Uh, it's well articulated. Uh, which I think is, is important. Uh, that being said, uh, one term that really caught my eye uh, when, re when reviewing a lot of the literature uh, surrounding this issue uh, last night is the term psychological harassment uh, and just the lack of clarity of an operational definition uh, of this term uh, in the workplace. Uh, just having a background in mental health myself as a mental health professional, uh, some of the current literature uh, which I'd be happy to share uh, with my colleagues, uh, often shows common themes uh, within the workplace, within psychological harassment. Uh, for example, uh, it can be a repeated offence, uh, it's unwanted, uh, it can impact the dignity uh, of the employees or the physical or psychological integrity uh, and can create a harmful working environment. I think an accurate definition uh, of the terms uh, put forth uh, in this amendment uh, would go a long way in effective change in the workplace and effective reinforcement uh, of policies surrounding this issue. Uh, it's, it's difficult, with the, especially with psychological harassment, to identify what's psychological harassment, what's being rude, and what's something that should be investigated formally. Uh, there's often that gray area that takes expertise from from people knowledgeable, I think, in that field uh, to determine whether or not uh, if it's unacceptable, uh, I think, behavior uh, in the workplace. Uh, one thing I thought that might be something to think about moving forward uh, with an amendment such as this uh, is enabling the employer to conduct a comprehensive assessment uh, of current risks uh, for harassment, uh, especially psychological harassment in the workplace. Uh, and for bullying, for that matter. Uh, for example, when can an employee refuse to work uh, due to harassment? Uh, when should a mediator be used? Uh, just sort of those formal uh, procedures. Uh, some jurisdictions uh, think that a zero tolerance policy may be something worth considering, uh, which is difficult because there has to be an issue of discipline uh, coupled with the uh, work performance of the employee, uh, which needs to be at an acceptable level as well. Uh, I do think as uh, initiatives in Canada uh, and around the world uh, continue uh, to decrease stigma surrounding mental illness, uh, that we're going to see more and more uh, workplace uh, issues uh, relating to psychological uh, abuse, psychological harassment, and things of that nature. Uh, so I do think the legislation does need to be modernized in that respect. Uh, it's, it's outdated. Uh, I think it's too, much, too vague, to be honest. Uh, like I said, we need specific uh, definitions uh, in order to effectively change uh, current practices. Uh, there needs to also be a clear communication uh, of what services are available uh, to those that have been impacted by psychological harassment, uh, bullying, cyberbullying, those sorts of things. Uh, for example, I was reviewing uh, the respectful workplace policy last night uh, for Nova Scotia government uh, employees. Uh, and primarily that em emphasizes uh, mediation, uh, basically for almost all of uh, disputes, uh, which that is, that's, like, that's good in certain situations, uh, but if, if it's not warranted, it's not really going to be effective in uh, effectively uh, resolving the dispute. Uh, some other jurisdictions are actually uh, implementing bystander training uh, to, te to teach your colleagues uh, what to watch out for, uh, how, to, how to advocate on your behalf, uh, potentially how to communicate to you uh, that, that, that that is inappropriate behavior, uh, it's not acceptable. Uh, 
uh, and it is a formal kind of issue that has to be investigated. Uh, one thing I do find kind of confusing about the current uh, legislation, uh, that violence needs to include harassment. Uh, then, then you can get an internal investigator for your issue. And I mean, that's a, that's a lot of terminology, uh, which would be highly open, I think, to interpretation, uh, which wouldn't be effective necessarily at uh, alleviating the problem, I don't think. Uh, having worked with many people uh, with various mental health issues, uh, myself personally, uh, I can say one thing for certain, that mental health doesn't discriminate. Uh, it's very fluid. Uh, it's constantly changing. Uh, can it be impacted uh, from one day to the next? Uh, I think a lot of times, especially uh, in professional working environments where we work with the public, uh, this, can, this can be impacted by life stressors. Stress stressors uh, it can change uh, quite quickly from day to day. And often people deal with their own mental health uh, very quietly because they're afraid to seek help and come forth, uh, like I said, due to stigma in the workplace, uh, especially those individuals uh, living with depression, anxiety, kind of social phobias, those sorts of things. Uh, so if they're already living with those sorts of issues as it is, uh, it's going to be increasingly difficult for them to come forward and convey their concerns to their employer uh, with the hopes to resolve uh, the issues. Uh, like I said, the, I think the Act does need some modernization. Uh, I think it needs some specification in regards to its terminology. Uh, and these, these uh, operational definitions should be guided by, uh, I think, evidence-based uh, resources. Uh, so they're concrete and quantifiable uh, in the event that we want to actually uh, implement meaningful change uh, in this policy development. Uh, I know personally the Mental Health Commission of Canada, uh, the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews, uh, just for a couple of examples, are excellent resources uh, for those looking for up-to-date current uh, best practices uh, in mental health uh, in general. Uh, I also think it's, it's important to have consultation uh, with reputable stakeholders in Nova Scotia uh, and just thoroughly understand what's currently being done uh, in the workplace right now uh, to alleviate psychological harassment, uh, cyberbullying, bullying, uh, and things of that nature. Because uh, until you have an accurate understanding of what's being done currently, it's kind of hard to implement, I think, effective and meaningful change. And I just want to re reiterate that uh, mental health impacts everyone. And uh, one of my colleagues in Cape Breton, a uh, well-respected uh, clinician, uh, he often says to patients that mental health uh, doesn't discriminate uh, despite age, occupation, uh, et cetera. So it's uh, quite important. And I think people uh, forget that people with uh, optimal mental health actually increase uh, productivity in the workplace, uh, contributing to uh, a more efficient economy, a more vibrant economy. Uh, they have less sick days at work, uh, for example, and they're less likely to schedule off work uh, due to fear and intimidation and things of that nature. I think what will make it uh, a priority uh, is a strong, uh, sustained commitment to improving mental health uh, and constantly reviewing the implementation of our evidence-based uh, interventions, uh, and also becoming aware uh, of what's being done in other jurisdictions uh, as well. There also has to be a, f a balance between uh, employees receiving criticism, uh, constructive criticism, uh, and as long as it's not in the form of bullying, uh, in order to have uh, appropriate uh, job performance. Uh, I think it's, it's okay to have a vigorous debate as long as it's professional, uh, respectful, and it's not a form of intimidation, I guess, in the workplace. Uh, like I said, there has to be a lot of consultation, I think, from, uh, from workers and employers. Uh, there needs to be a lot of consultation from experts in this field uh, that can kind of sit down and explain what the best practices are currently. 
uh, to alleviate this issue, as I know it's very important uh, to, I think, all those in uh, Nova Scotia. And uh, I, th I do think the intent of this is, is great. And uh, I just think uh, it just needs some some work in the form of definitions and clarification based on uh, research and evidence. And, uh, and I think it's something we could work on moving forward. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I am pleased to rise and speak uh, to uh, this bill. Um, I guess I'll start by saying that it is very curious to me, Madam Speaker, to see in this chamber the resistance to this bill. This is a chamber where uh, just the last time we were here, we talked at great length, uh, led by the Leader of the Opposition, uh, about workplace bullying and harassment. And yet, uh, we here in Nova Scotia are the only jurisdiction in Canada the only jurisdiction in Canada that has neither introduced nor publicly announced any intention of introducing legislation to include bullying and psychological injury as a cause of workplace harm under the occupational health and safety laws. And I've sat here for the last half an hour and I've listened to my colleagues talk about bullying and talk about definitions of bullying, uh, but steadfastly decline to acknowledge that this is something uh, that should be included in our Occupational Health and Safety Act, and it is curious to me, Madam Speaker. Uh, our current bill, Madam Speaker, uh, does not just ignore the issue of workplace bullying, it explicitly omits that as a cause under the bill. We're not just saying we haven't thought about bullying, Madam Speaker, we're saying if you are experiencing harassment or bullying or psychological injury at work, you are out of luck, Madam Speaker. Uh, this is what we think is a very common sense issue that we are trying to fix. Um, and again, I will say that I am mystified by the fact that no other party in this chamber seems to share that uh, view. Uh, the Workplace Bullying Institute describes bullying as a perpetrator's need to control the targeted individuals with harmful consequences for the targeted person. And I agree with my colleague that we need to be clear about definitions. And so here, Madam Speaker, is what bullying and harassing behavior is not. It is not expressing differences of opinion. It is not offering constructive feedback, guidance, or advice about work-related behavior. It's not reasonable management of a worker by, a, by an employer. What we're talking about here, Madam Speaker, is aggression. And aggression can be obvious and it can be subtle. And there is no checklist, but I suspect if I were permitted to ask for a show of hands of people in this chamber who have experienced some kind of aggression focused on them at work that has made their workplace difficult or intolerable, I would see many hands, Madam Speaker, because it exists in workplaces across the province and we know this. So some examples of what we are discussing as bullying for clarity of definitions would be spreading malicious rumors, gossip, or innuendo excluding or isolating someone socially. And this is over a prolonged period of time such that their workplace becomes intolerable. Intimidation, deliberate undermining, physically abusing or threatening abuse, removing areas of responsibility without cause, changing work guidelines, withholding information, giving the wrong information such that someone is unable to complete their job, making jokes that are obviously offensive and that put a person at risk of psychological harm, pestering, spying, stalking, yelling, using profanity, constant criticism. It's what we all do every day, Madam Speaker, in this House, but we have rules. We have rules that govern it. And when we fall afoul of those rules, Madam Speaker, in this House, we have a system that we can avail ourselves of, imperfect as it is, where we can try and resolve disputes. That system in the larger workforce, Madam Speaker, is the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And yet, workplace bullying and harassment is explicitly excluded from that act, Madam Speaker. 
Psychological harassment in the workplace is an occupational health and safety hazard. People experiencing workplace bullying often deal with serious consequences for both their mental and physical health. They have an increased sense of vulnerability. They often have an inability to sleep, uh, panic or anxiety. In some severe cases, post-traumatic stress. It leads to family discord. It certainly leads to low morale and productivity. Uh, I think that the member opposite spoke about balancing the needs of employees and employers. Well, Madam Speaker, it is not to the advantage of any employer to have a dysfunctional workplace. We're not talking about employers per se as the perpetrators. We're talking about an overall system that people in a workplace can avail themselves of. And in that workplace, that bullying, as I said, has consequences. Psychological health can, psychological harassment at work can and does undermine the health of an entire organization. Some examples, and uh, an interesting, you know, if you look at the large surveys of workplaces, um, we've seen them in our own public service, we've seen them uh, in municipal public service, and, and where uh, those places get a failing grade are in things like increased absenteeism, increased turnover, increased stress, increased use of employee assistance programs. Many of those things can be traced back to some kind of psychological harassment or bullying, uh, people not being able to perform their job properly. It can lead to decreased productivity and motivation, decreased morale. Certainly, it does not reflect well on an organization uh, to see that kind of flagging morale and challenges. It could be poor customer service, certainly, in the service industry. And Madam Speaker, we know that workplace bullying is happening, in alar happening at an alarming rate. Uh, I think um, the, one of uh, my colleagues mentioned uh, we need to look at the evidence. Well, you know, this, this issue came to us from people who had experienced this firsthand, um, but also from Equity Watch, who works specifically on these issues. The Canadian Safety Council of Canada reports that in the workplace, one in six people have been bullied, and one in five has witnessed a coworker being bullied. A 2018 study from Statistics Canada found that almost one in five women had been harassed at work at some point during the year, while one in eight women reported, one in eight men reported similar experiences. Verbal abuse was experienced most often, with 13% of women and 10% of men reporting it in the prior 12 months. Next most prevalent was humiliating behavior reported by 6% of women and 5% of men. And I'm just going to repeat that, Madam Speaker. 13% of women in the workplace and 10% of men reported that they had experienced verbal abuse in the past 12 months. Now, the member opposite talked about how uh, we educate our children, and, and I'll come back to that point. But the fact of the matter is, is uh, we can't... Um, know what happens in everyone's homes. And we can't know what circumstances everyone is battling with at their homes. Uh, but what we can do is protect people from abuse and harassment in the places uh, where they work. And that's what this legislation is intended to do, Madam Speaker. Women were found to suffer physical violence at twice the rate of men and were five times as likely to report sexual harassment or unwanted sexual attention. And this last point echoes prior research. For women, Madam Speaker, being young, single, or unmarried was found to add to this vulnerability. Researchers suggest that these characteristics may be proxies for less seniority at work and poor job quality, factors that may increase the likelihood of experiencing sexual harassment in the workplace to the extent that they imply low organizational power. And again, Madam Speaker, if I were permitted to canvass the women in this chamber about the experiences that they had, certainly starting out in their career, um, 
I, uh, I don't think I'd be going so far as to say that at least some of us would agree that we experienced uh, many of these things. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, as uh, ambitious, probably most of us, um, professionally oriented women, uh, we powered through, Madam Speaker. Um, but is that what we expect uh, w young women in the workforce to do? Uh, we know that in many professions, young women are overrepresented at the bottom and they are underrepresented at the top. And I would suggest to you, Madam Speaker, that the lack of protections like these, real protections, protections with teeth, uh, are one of the reasons why that happens. I know that in the profession I came from, law, uh, that is absolutely true. I don't have the statistics, but more than 50% of the women graduate, uh, people graduating from law school are women. Uh, I suspect that that uh, ratio holds through through the articling years. Um, partnerships are male, Madam Speaker, uh, with some exceptions. Uh, I think it's changing, um, but it looks nothing like uh, the people who are graduating. And that is because uh, there are many organizations and workplaces and professions that are still uh, fundamentally hostile and adversarial in their makeup, Madam Speaker, uh, and there are not adequate protections for people who find themselves in those jobs. Um, and to that point, uh, the member opposite uh, raised the idea of restorative approaches and being open to listening. And Madam Speaker, uh, quite frankly, um, in situations where you have extreme power imbalances, uh, where women are battling in patriarchal systems, uh, when they are experiencing harassment and abuse, not just women, but I'm using women as an example here, uh, it is a relatively established fact that those restorative approaches do not work. Uh, they do not work, Madam Speaker, because they work when two parties can come to the table on relatively equal footing. Um, I'm a huge fan of restorative justice. Um, I support uh, the work that the province has done in restorative justice. I think it's really important, but it doesn't always work, Madam Speaker. Uh, back to the idea um, about how we teach our children, uh, how we, how we, what kind of society we want to create. Uh, of course, we want to teach our children to uh, be sensitive and caring and compassionate and collaborative, and education plays a role. But do you know what else does, Madam Speaker? Law. Law plays a role. It plays a role in what we expect of people all the way through, um, and in particular what we expect of adults. So regardless, it, you know, I, I am quite an idealistic, utopian person, and, and I hope that we find a time when we are all um, regard each other in a different way, uh, and when our communities are strengthened, and when we can be, all be kind and understanding and clear with each other. But until that time, Madam Speaker, we have rules and we have laws. Children have rules in school. Uh, Grown-ups have rules uh, in their workplaces. And those are the things that help us police our behavior, Madam Speaker. And those are exactly the kind of things that we are proposing in this piece of legislation. Um, Workplace bullying has been recognized as a global problem, Madam Speaker. The International Labor Organization recently passed a convention recognizing that harassment and violence on the job is incompatible with decent work. Canada is a signatory to this convention, and our country's delegation was instrumental in drafting it. All member states have a responsibility to promote, quote, a general environment of zero tolerance when it comes to workplace harassment and bullying. I hope, Madam Speaker, although I am somewhat skeptical after hearing the remarks of my colleagues, that all members of this House will agree with me and with the International Labour Organization that bullying and harassment at work are unacceptable. And if we can agree on that, Madam Speaker, we need to ensure that our laws reflect our zero tolerance attitude on this issue. Passing this bill, Madam Speaker, would protect all workers in Nova Scotia from bullying in the workplace and would give them the right to refuse work in an unsafe environment. And this point, Madam Speaker, is key to the point that people can avail themselves of the Human Rights Commission and other tribunals. That may be. It is slow, it is painful, it is tedious, it is rarely uh, satisfying at the end. Um, 
but they may not refuse work in an unsafe environment. That's because the Occupational Health and Safety Act is specifically designed to govern what happens at work. This bill would it require employers to take concrete steps to prevent harassment and bullying. It would make looking the other way when an employer is being harassed illegal. This is the standard in every other jurisdiction in Canada, Madam Speaker, and it's high time we adopted it here. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and thank you to uh, my colleagues for their remarks. I'm going to speak uh, to this just briefly based on a constituency experience. Um, I was approached by uh, a group of constituents. All of them actually were women. All of them had had separate experiences in workplaces that had led to them um, eventually leaving those workplaces. That, that certainly they would just describe as, as bullying. Um, and, and those experiences were, were varied. Um, and they were so looking for, um, they, were, they were looking for help, they were looking for remedy. And also, um, while some of them had been through the Human Rights um, uh, Commission in, in some fashion or other with, with various <coughs> results, I think really they were looking for healing. And, and it strikes me that this proposal from our caucus, which is you know, not unprecedented um, by any stretch, actually creates a possibility for, for um, not just for healing, but for prevention, because that is the fundamental basis of occupational health and safety. It's the fundamental approach in the Occupational Health and Safety Act. It is the function of occupational health and safety committees. Um, and so how much better to prevent bullying and harassment with, and psychological injury than it is to then remedy it after the fact? Um, and, and that's why I think, um, you know, as the leaders of this province, we, you know, I, I beg all of my fellow members and, in, in, you know, the members of the official opposition and the members of the government to, to really consider this. Um, we have structures that exist already where there is, um, where there is a, a workplace where there are more than 20 employees, an occupational health and safety committee has to be in place. I've had uh, some limited experience uh, in in workplaces with occupational health and safety committees, and frankly, um, you know, I think it, I think it varies uh, according to the sector. But in some cases, those committee meetings can be pretty dry. Can be pretty, you know, like how many times can you uh, can you inspect the expiry date on the the smoke, to, you know, on the on the fire extinguishers, and you know, uh, go over a, a workplace for tripping hazards. I mean, that is that is not the case clearly in construction and you know many ma manufacturing workplaces. But given that every workplace with more than 20 employees has to have an occupational health and safety committee. Why not put it to work with something that is uh, juicy and meaningful and which where we know that there is an unmet need uh, in, you know, in our province. Um, and so, uh, and the occupational health and safety committees are already constructed to sort of redress some of the issues um, which we know um, are contributing to uh, individuals' experiences of, of bullying and psychological injury in the workplace. Um, for example, the committees are struck, you know, with an equal, it, it cannot have a majority of managers, for example. Uh, there will be an there, there will be a representative who is chosen by the, the people um, that that individual represents a health and safety uh, representative. So there, there are a number of things, I think even by inviting the conversation into our workplaces and allowing that conversation to expand to this super important dimension of um, you know, how we treat each other, how we are ensuring that in fact none of our colleagues is, um, is, is being injured uh, uh, by, by mistreatment, by 
in the workplace, inviting that conversation is in, in itself preventative. And that is um, just dramatically different from saying, you know, you can call the Human Rights Commission. Frankly, by the time you're, by the time you're, you know, any one of us advises a constituent who calls, you know, why, you know, maybe you should call the Human Rights Commission. We already know that um, that the chances of that person, you know, getting to uh, getting to thrive and be productive in their workplace is is very unlikely, and we know that. If that person has that experience and that is the only remedy that they have, um, then, then chances are whoever replaces them will encounter the same dynamic. And so uh, that to me seems wholly inadequate and, and certainly very far from the sort of ambition that we should have for, uh, for Nova Scotians. And when I think about um, some of the some of the experiences that we have heard coming out when there are Human Rights Commission cases that are decided, and, this, and the story involves like a, really a litany of experiences of discrimination and intimidation and harassment. Um, those, those, are, those are experiences, are, those, are, those are stories and, and really uh, cases of, of victimhood that, that make me feel, uh, I mean, personal shame would be too great, but it's just like, it, that is, we, we should be better than that. Mm. We should be better than that as a province. And, and where we have the ability to create a mechanism so, that might, might actually prevent that and redress it so that we're not hearing a story of, you know, 15 years or 10 years or even two years of experience of, uh, of persecution in a workplace, I think we really, we really should be considering doing just that. Uh, the resources, because, because we would not be the first jurisdiction to do that, there are so many resources available online. There are, you know, there are, there are processes, there are fact sheets, um, there is legislation, and uh, that is what, having looked across um, other jurisdictions we in the NDP caucus have offered to this house today. Thank you. I recognize the host leader for the NDP. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. That concludes opposition business for today. I will turn it over to the government house leader to call business for tomorrow. I recognize the government house leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, that concludes the government's business as well. I move that the House now rise to meet again tomorrow, Thursday, October 17th, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 11.59 p.m. Following the daily routine in QP, business will include second reading on Bills 197, 203, 201, and 203, third reading on Bills 152, 160, 163, 166, and 170, Committee of the Whole House on Bills, 169, 175, 177, 180, 187, 189, 191, 192, and 193, as well as uh, we will also have a, one of our new members uh, participate in address and reply. And that does it for tomorrow, we hope. The motion is that the House rise to meet again on Thursday, October 17, between the hours of 1 and 11.59 p.m. Would those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. Aye. The motion is carried. We stand adjourned until 1 p.m. tomorrow. We have now reached the moment of interruption. The adjournment notice was submitted by the member, um, for, submitted by uh, the leader of the NDP, and uh, and reads. Be it resolved that the Liberal government has profoundly disrespected the people of Pictou Landing First Nation, mill workers, forestry workers, fishers, tourism operators, and others by its negligent 
handling of the situation at Northern Pulp and its failure to affirm the January 31st 2020 deadline for Boat Harbour will be honoured. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the NDP. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I want to begin by doing what has not always been done by all others on this subject, and that is to just state unequivocally and clearly our position, which is that Boat Harbour and the Boat, the Boat Harbour Act must be honoured and the flow of effluent into Boat Harbor must be ceased after January 31st, 2020. That's one. Two is that the government's negligent and irresponsible handling of the entire question of Northern Pulp has placed thousands of people in Nova Scotia today, particularly on the Northern mainland, particularly in Pictou County, in the grip of a terrible vice of anxiety. The hundreds of employees at the mill and those who do contract work there are in the vice of a highly uncertain future. So are those whose living is dependent on other mills across the province where the business model is deeply tied into the market for residuals at Northern Pulp. So are all the contractors, many of whom have worked now for an extended period with worn out gear spending more time welding than harvesting because the situation has been too uncertain to justify the longer-term investment in new harvesting equipment. So are all the truckers whose situation is not greatly different. So are all the communities from Pictou to Greenfield, Elmsdale and Enfield to Middle Muscadabit and many others where the specter of their mills going down is of a scale like that of Black Friday in 67 in Cape Breton. So are all the communities that continue to live with division about this issue. And so is the community of Pictou Landing, where the government's refusal to reaffirm unequivocally that pulp effluent will not flow into Boat Harbour after January 31st has fueled fears that the covenant made with the government on, in 2015 on this subject is a covenant that, like so many others, will not be honoured. And why? How could this anxious, dark vice into which so many have been pressured, how could this have happened? It has happened first because of the malevolence of Northern Pulp, who after years of having been chiselly business partners with suppliers, mills and contractors, have capped off a half century of undermining public confidence by not even submitting a completed plan for an effluent treatment alternative to Boat Harbour until four months before the deadline of the Boat Harbour Act itself. But more than this, this situation has developed because of the incompetent negligence of the Liberal government of Nova Scotia. It was always simply incompetent to require only a class one environmental assessment of the effluent project at Northern Pulp, both because the volume of scientific, engineering and technical information the project entails is beyond the scope of such assessments, and also because the curtailed scope of a class one assessment, unlike a class two or a federal assessment, never had the capacity to begin with to supply the public confidence, which is, after all, the purpose of such assessments. But even beyond this, it was incompetent to the point of negligence to have allowed the company to squander all the time that was available to bring forward a proposal from the Boat Harbour Act's 2015 passage and not to exercise the leadership people reasonably expect of their government to insist that the company bring forward a proposal in a way that would be timely enough that could have allowed both for comprehensive public scrutiny and for faithfulness to the deadline in the Act. Over and over we have said to the government, time is passing. What are you doing to make sure that five-year time frame of the Act is being used effectively towards a viable solution? And time and time again, what we have received in response has been a shrug, a passing off of responsibility, a, no, not us, we just wait to receive what we receive, etc., and so on. 
And the result is the vice that we're in today. With a focus report in the process of receiving public comment, three and a half months from the Boat Harbour deadline, which calls for a project of that focus report requiring 21 months construction. Naturally, the people of our province look to their government to square this circle. And so journalists ask, and demonstrators ask, and we and the NDP here ask, will the Premier reaffirm his commitment that no effluent will go into Boat Harbour after the deadline? And the answers that have been received are all of the character of a shrug, a what's your problem, and evasion. So the Premier speaks about the commitment to Boat Harbour, but avoids mentioning a date. That is an evasion. Uh, or he says that these are questions that belong not with the government, with the, but with the regulator. That's a shrug. Or he says, what's the issue? There's an act on the books, no other act is coming before the House, as though we were in some place other than a few minutes before 12 midnight on this matter as though there were nothing in the situation that should reasonably cause anyone uh, alarm or worry. That's a brush off. It is also profoundly disrespectful in its failure to even acknowledge the reality of the vice that thousands of people in Nova Scotia are in today about this question. As though to say, oh, come on now, people, never mind that the company has a 21-month project and a three-and-a-half-month window, and most of that three-and-a-half months is going to be taken up with the hyper-intensified last-minute assessment process. Never mind that. What's your problem? Our problem, Madam Speaker, is people's living and its extraordinary importance. And the fact that everything regarding it deserves the best a government can bring forward. Not a shrug, not an evasion, not a brush off. And our problem is that we share the deep concern of the 300 people who marched in a walk of concern and hope in Pictou Landing less than two weeks ago, who are deeply worried that the government is failing to demonstrate the kind of character that provides confident assurance that the covenant of the Boat Harbour Act, in fact, is going to be honoured. Because if there is one thing that is certain in this vice-filled northern pop pulp debacle, it is that none of the corporate slash government negligence, none of the corporate slash incompetence that permeates this whole story going back a long time, none of it is the fault of anyone in Pictou Landing. I was moved a couple of weeks ago at the Finn Atlantic International Film Festival screening of a documentary on environmental racism in Nova Scotia called There's Something in the Water by the testimony of Michelle Francis Denny about the sorrow Boat Harbor has meant in her family and her community over the last five decades. She said there this, everybody's got to believe in something. I believe in January 31st, 2020. I'll say, absolutely. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. I want to thank uh, the member uh, for his uh, speech. Uh, I guess uh, I, I want to start out by talking about respect, because I guess I'm a little confused. Um, we want to talk about uh, fear-mongering and uh, uh, bills. I don't see any bill before this legislature that is contrary to the bill that was put forward five years ago. If we want to talk about facts, we can talk about how under the NDP they bought land at $300 an acre and then they turned around and they sold it to Northern Pulp at $172.63 an acre, a gift of $7 million. I wonder where the member opposite was and what he stood for when his government, that he was a huge part of, gave this gift to Northern Pulp. No government has given more to Northern Pulp, and it's factual, it's on the record. No government has ever given more to Northern Pulp than the former NDP government. We talk about profound disrespect. Where was the respect from, let's say, let's just take a few years here, 2000 to 2013, 
when the members and the individuals of the Pictou Landing First Nation begged, begged former governments, PC and NDP, to do something, to do anything. Throw us a lifeline. Prove to us that we matter. Crickets. We have three members opposite that represent the community of Pictou. And we'll hear from one of them tonight. Yet it's ironic to me that we're doing this debate and it's the member from Halifax Shibukdo that's bringing this topic up. Where's the passion? Where's the fight? We want to talk about respect? Let's talk about the dozens and dozens and dozens of times that members and the Premier and Cabinet Ministers have met with Chief Andrea Paul, have had discussions with Pictou Landing First Nations, where the former Environment Minister went down and stood in Pictou with one of the members from uh, uh, Pictou and the current MP and had discussions with the Fishers. Can we say anyone else in this room has done that? An open forum where they took questions and concerns where I can count probably hundreds of times we've had discussions, individuals, as a caucus, and I'm sure all of you have, but hundreds of times with the forest industry, with foresters, with members from our community and members from your community. That's real consultation, that's respect. This is the first government in the history of Northern Pulp, and this, you can't deny it, that has ever put anything in legislation, that has ever put anything in legislation. The day that happened, the community of Picto and Picto Landing First Nation was given hope that they were finally being heard. And what we're hearing today is, wait a second, we don't know, but maybe, it could be, it might not happen. That to me is disrespectful. It's disrespectful to pretend, to insinuate, to act like you know something's gonna happen with no evidence at all. And I'm gonna give you evidence on how we've reacted. And I, I'm passionate about this because I've stood in this legislature and I've been taunted by members across the floor about an environmental issue in my community that they said will never happen. Nothing's gonna happen. No cleanup. Harrodsfield and the CND site in Harrodsfield. Members opposite have taunted me when I stood up and gave passionate speeches about that community and the individuals there. Well, Madam Speaker, August 2020, clean, done, remediated. They're on site right now cleaning it up. They're on site right now after decades of the NDP and the Conservative government turning a blind eye to that community. The only time their eyes opened up was during an election when they thought, you know what? We got them. We got them. We'll use it as a wedge. I want to thank them for using it as a wedge. I want to like, continue. It's great. It inspires us. It inspired me. It made me go to Ottawa and fight harder. It made me go across the street. It made me talk to the ministers. It made me fight harder. Not a single peep from the two former governments. Let's talk about um, the, um, oh my, sorry, the MV minor. Let's talk about the cost of the MV minor. Let's talk about the impact the MV minor had. I'm trying to remember the year that that happened. Nope. 2011. 2011 is when the MV Minor hit the shores in Sydney, Cape Breton. Crickets. Nobody came to their rescue. We had a conservative federal government in a majority position. We had a majority NDP government. Crickets. 
Nothing. And you'd think with 38,200 38, kilograms of asbestos, 26,675 liters of petroleum product, and 35,000 kilograms of floatables, I don't even want to know what that is, sitting on a wilderness site, a designated wilderness site. People would have came to the rescue. They would have come crawling, they would have come screaming, they would have pulled their MPs, they would have fought with the current government of the day to ensure that that got cleaned up. Here, here. Nothing. Right. Nothing. So for the member opposite to insinuate that we are going to break our promise to the Picto Landing First Nation, to Chief Andrea Paul. Like the for if the member from um, Cape Breton wants to stand up and, have, and, and talk about this, maybe she should. Maybe she should. Because the MV minor wasn't in my backyard, it was in yours. Yeah. Didn't hear a peep. Don't talk about then. So if we want to. The member from Halifax Atlantic has the floor. We want to talk about our record, our record on the environment. It's pretty clear. It's pretty clear. In fact, I recall recently reading a book on the on the uh, on the picta, or on the on the mill, aptly called the mill. It's a sad history of pretend promises. Wool over your eyes, elect me, look what I will do. And we put it in legislation. We talked to Picto Land First Nation. We talked to Chief Andrea Paul. And I was going to come up here, I was going to come here with news articles. You've all got Google. Take a moment. Google. We have to respect our forest industry, one of the biggest industries we have that for me, is impactful, but for most of you sitting around that from rural Nova Scotia, has a huge impact on all of you. We have to respect our fishers as someone who comes from a fishing community. We have to make sure our water is clean. But all I hear now is, it's not going to happen. It's fear monger. Well, look back at the MV Minor, look back at Harry's Field. The NDP had their chance, they failed. The PCs are sitting on the fence. We committed to Boat Harbor, and it's going to get clean. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Pictou East. Thank you, thank you, Madam uh, Madam Speaker. And this is obviously a, a, a file that's very stressful for a lot of people. It's causing. There's a lot of uh, sleepless nights across this province right now over this file, and, and that's uh, people who work in the fishing industry, uh, people who are foresters, work for the mill, community members. People are, are very, very stressed out about where this file is going to go. And they come at it from their own perspectives. But nonetheless, we need to respect the fact that this is creating a lot of stress. Uh, for, so for that re reason, I'm happy my, my colleague brought this uh, to, to, bait, to the debate floor tonight. And um, it's interesting that those who lecture upon the subject of respect often don't possess it. And I think we've just seen a, a good exhibit for that uh, tonight, Madam Chair. The motion reads, uh, the motion reads that um, the way that the the, the Liberal government has handled this, has profoundly disrespected the people of Pictou Landing First Nations. Mill workers, foresters, fishers, tourism operators, and appropriately, others. Uh, because the way that this file has been handled has been disrespectful to most Nova Scotians. Uh, from the very onset, there was uh, just a, a culture of disrespect from this government towards the people impacted by this bill. And the, the, the way that the file has been handled at every step, at every step along the way, it, it, uh, it is negligent. Uh, so I, I, do, I do agree with the, uh, with, the, with the member's assessment on that. 
And I could, uh, um, if we're interested in a little history lesson, um, I think the members who were in this chamber at the time that the Boat Harbour Act uh, was tabled and ultimately passed unanimously uh, by this House, there was some observations made, some constructive feedback, uh, some amendments were put forward to that bill at the time. And the most significant amendment that was proposed to this legislature that was ignored and dismissed out of hand is an amendment that would have avoided much of this stress. Uh, that was an amendment to, to amend the Boat Harbor Act to include a timeline that would have included a timeline all at every opportunity so that Nova Scotians could assess the progress towards the goal, the admirable goal of the closure of Boat Harbour. Most Nova Scotians support that goal. I certainly support that goal, um, and I know that most of the people of my community uh, support that goal. Uh, by the way, I am the member, uh, I would be the member in this chamber, and probably one of, uh, you could probably go back uh, 30 or 40 years of members in this chamber, go back to the beginning of Boat Harbour, and you would, you would be hard pressed to find a member that sat in this legislature that has been to, has passed, has been close to Boat Harbour than myself. I live minutes from Boat Harbour. I intimately understand Boat Harbour and its impacts on the community. And the bill would have included a timeline, but at the time, uh, the, the minister uh, that introduced the bill made a comment that said, um, um, the comment was, oh, we can, we can, we can read, read the comment. On April, 25th, on April 21st, 2015, uh, the minister said, with regard to this legislation, we could talk about adding more to the bill and putting in a time frame and deliverables, but my fear is if we do that, is if we start putting in goals, if any of those are not met, then we don't get to the ultimate goal which we all want. Well, Madam Chair, uh, the, the, that, that, that prediction came true uh, because by not putting in timelines, by not allowing the people to assess progress, by not even being concerned enough to assess process, uh, progress as a government, which they weren't, um, then we are where we are. And I am the member who said a long time ago, I don't know, maybe two years ago, that a class one was not enough. I wrote to the minister, I think there's been three ministers of the environment on this file. Um, and, and I wrote to the minister of the day saying, a class one is not enough. The job of government is simple. The job of government is to receive an application, to scrutinize that application, to give the public comfort and confidence that the proposed project, whatever it may be, meets the standards of the province. And a class one assessment was never going to give the public confidence that the job has been done by government to properly scrutinize. It's just not gonna happen. And we can talk about the conflicts that this government is in. Uh, we know now, I mean, as we sit here today, the minister, current minister of the environment, uh, a newly promoted minister after, after um, dissembling uh, the Public Accounts Committee got a promotion. Uh, he did some bidding of the Premier on that, got rid of the Public Accounts Committee. He's now seated two seats away from the Premier. And that is the person that's the independent regulator of the process that's before the government. And that's a little bit hard for most Nova Scotians to swallow because this government was negligent at every step of the way, starting with the timeline, starting by not putting the appropriate level of scrutiny into the process. Nobody trusts this government. Nobody trusts this government. You might find 27 Nova Scotians that trust this government. They're all sitting there patting themselves in the back. But this is a file that's been negligently handled from the beginning. And what Nova Scotian should believe that the handling of the process going forward will be any different? Sometimes history is an indication of the future. And nobody should take confidence in the way that this file has been handled. Nobody should feel respected by this government on the handling of this file. Everyone's a loser in this file. Everyone's a loser in this file. And, and the, the minister, the, the, the well, <laughs> 
That's the opposite of a Freudian slip. Sometimes Freudian slips come true, this one won't. The member made a comment uh, that there is no bill uh, before, uh, before the House. And that is true as we sit here today. But I think the member and many people impacted by this, those of us that sincerely care about the outcome here, we read with interest the Premier's editorial, uh, where the Premier talked uh, about this situation and talked about the admirable goal of closing Boat Harbour. But he did neglect one fact that was noticed uh, by every reader of that editorial, and that is he didn't put the date in there. And I think it's fair for people to be concerned when you have something that is as stressful of the, as this situation. It is very, very fair uh, for Nova Scotians to read every word that's written very carefully and to make note of those words that are not written. And that was a very significant omission, and that is something that is amping up uh, the, stress, the stress level. But um, in terms of, in terms of the, the, the deadline, uh, the, the question of extend, not extend, that's, that's a simple question that gets asked, but it's a, it's a complex question. Uh, and I myself have always said, uh, um, um, for two years, uh, for two years, I heard Northern Paul say, "Trust the science." Trust the science. And when they finally submitted their application, the feedback was the science wasn't there. So that is that is something that gives me uh, concern around the focus report. It's up to Northern Paul to earn the right to operate in this province. That is on Northern Paul. And I do um, I do agree with the with the premier's uh, words around that. That. Um, um, but I, and I feel that extensions are to be earned, not given. So um, the, the, the member can talk about uh, MV minors and, and, um, and Harriet's Field and, and various issues, but you can't sprinkle the word respect in the same speech because we're here to talk about a certain issue that he doesn't want to talk about because he doesn't know where, he's going to, where his premier is going to go with this situation either because he probably read the editorial that we read uh, where the Premier uh, left out those words. But um, the public consultation period is open, and I do encourage all Nova Scotians to, uh, to put their feedback on record on the submission to the focus report, because um, the issue is much bigger than the members in this chamber. The issue is the one that is keeping um, foresters awake, that is keeping fishers awake, that's keeping mill workers, community members, that's keeping all those Nova Scotians awake, that is the ones, those are the people that need to be respected by this process. And I wish that this government, this government, uh, this government would put down a process. <clears throat> I wish to thank all members who participated in the adjournment debate this evening. The House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. tomorrow.